Hi, I'm Mohit Yadav and I teach at Scalar Academy. After taking more than 200 interviews, I've come to a realization that most people lack one common trait, which is to design a good relational database. Now, why this problem arises? The root cause of this problem can be attributed to that many people come from a NoSQL background and hence they try to denormalize everything and put all the attributes in a single entity. Therefore, it becomes very critical to understand the basic fundamentals of schema design. This will not only help you in clearing the interviews, but it will also help you in building a repo and having technical discussion amongst your peer group. If you are someone who often finds it difficult to convert the real world requirements into the entity and relationship diagrams, then this video is for you. In this video, we are going to discuss about relational schema design using LinkedIn as an example. We are going to discuss about one-to-many relationship, many-to-many -many relationship. Apart from that, we'll also see when it makes sense to separate two entities even though the columns in both the entities are same. After this video, you'll be able to convert high-level requirements into relational database schema with ease. Now to design any relational data store schema, all you need to do is list down all the features. Then where you need to identify all the entities and relationship that will support your feature list. To do that, underline all the nouns and verbs. All the nouns will then correspond to either entities or it will be an attribute in one of the entities that you have already listed. The verbs will translate into either the status changes or the relationship between two entities. Now let's see this trick in action and design schema for LinkedIn. So let's go ahead and see how to apply those tricks in action. The first feature is that user should be able to view and edit his profile which contains the following information. This gives us a hint that there should be a user entity table. So let's add user entity. It can be a user profile as well. Let's keep it user profile for now. Every entity that you create will have one attribute which is ID. This will basically be used to uniquely identify a user profile. The other attributes would be coming from the next set of requirements. On top left, a, a user should have profile photo. On the right side of profile pic, we should also show name and contact information. So let's add these attributes inside a user profile entity. So we'll have a profile pic. Profile pic can be stored in two places. One is in the database itself. If you store the profile pic in the database, the amount of storage that is required to store all the information of the users will be very large. So it's wise to store all the images and video links that are associated with a particular profile into a file store like S3, or we can also store them in a CDN, right? So uh, instead of storing the profile pic, I'll store the URI, which will either correspond to S3 or uh, CDN or maybe any other file store as well. The next information uh, that I would have to store is the name and contact information in form of an email or phone number or both. A user can have multiple skills. So there are two options of uh, adding the skills. The first option is add that as a list object in the same user profile table. So if I'm adding this in the form of a list, how that will come up is uh, sample values will be Java, Java script and so on. Right? This poses a one major problem. The major problem is that if I want to find out all the users who have Java in their skills mentioned. So the problem would be that I would have to write something like a select star from user profile where skills like um, star uh, Java star which means that this is going to be a scan operation. So if I have multiple rows in my database, then I will end up scanning all the rows. If I, if I have 1 billion rows, I will scan 1 billion rows. So this approach will not scale. The other downside of this particular approach is that I will not be able to auto suggest skills to the user because that will be again a scan on all the uh, rows that are present in the database. So what we'll do is we'll add one more entity called skills. Now, this skill, there are two ways of adding skill, right? Uh, either we can have the skill ID, name, and user ID stored directly here. If I do something like this, then 
again auto complete will be slow because there will be multiple users and multiple users will be having multiple skills if you look closely the two entities the user profile entity and the skill entity what is the kind of relationship between these two entities right so user can have multiple skills similarly a skill can be uh, having multiple users right so it's a many to many kind of a relationship to model a many to many kind of a relationship what you should do is you should create a mapping table called user skills this will again all our entities have an id so it will start with an id we'll also have a user id here and skill id and we can remove the user id that was there in the skills object if we read the next set of requirements it states that we need to keep information about educational institutions and employers and if you look closely the attributes over here uh, in the educational institutions and the employers are same so what i can have is i can create a entity called organization inside an organization i can have an id field and all the other fields that are there depicting name start year end year and let's say description and i will need to have one more type uh, this type will store information of institution or company so from the looks of it uh, or for the given set of features this table works uh, really well the challenge over here is that what if i want to add other attributes let's say i want to add cgpa in the educational institution and i want to add salary details inside employers the problem here that comes is that i will have to add cgpa as a one column here and salary also as one more column now depending upon whether the type is institution or company either cgpa will be null or salary will be null now it is not a very good idea to enforce application logic in your database just by looking at the database you should be able to figure out that what are the uh, what each column means so to avoid such kind of a problem and to have you know uh, a design that is extensible what we can do is we can split this into two tables one would be a education and the other one would be a company both will have id both will have name it will have start year and it will also have end year type is not required because we have already split the table but this alone will not be able to give me any sense of uh, which user went to this particular university which users went to this particular company now what is the relationship between user and education and user and company we would realize that a user can go to multiple companies and he can also go to multiple institution for completing his education similarly a institution might have multiple students who are, who are studying in uh, in it in a company also there can be many employees so it's again a many to many kind of a relationship and we have learned uh, in the example above that whenever we have multiple uh, you know many to many kind of a relationship we create map mapping entities so there will be one table for user education and one table for user company the attributes will be id user id and education id education might not be a better word or the better word can be uh, institution over here so we'll have id we'll have user id and we'll have company id as well now if i want to find out all the users who have went to a particular institution what i'll do is i'll go to user education table and i'll query select start from user education where education id equal to the institute id the next requirement is to have recommendations now a particular user can either give recommendations or receive recommendations since this is a list it does not make sense to add this in uh, in the attributes of your particular user it makes sense to have a separate entity so let's go ahead and create a recommendation entity we'll have an id the person who has given the recommendation so let's say user id for that and it will also have a recipient id right do i need to create a mapping table in this case now a particular recommendation will have just one user id and it will also have one recipient that information is actually captured in this particular table so we don't need a mapping table in case of a recommendation so if i want to find out all the 
uh, recommendations that I have, what I'll do is I'll go to recommendation table and I'll select star from recommendations where recipient ID equal to my user ID. So the next requirement is having connections and followers. How connection and follower work is that if A sends a request to B, that means that A will be able to see all the public posts that are made by B. If B accepts that particular connection request, then B will also see all the posts that are made by A. Let's have a design that can model uh, this particular feature set. So we'll have a connection table. Inside this connection table, I'll have an ID. I'll have user one, user ID one, and I'll have user ID two. Whenever a new connection comes in, uh, I'll add that particular row here. And as soon as B accepts the request of A, I'll add one more row. So if I want to find out anybody's followers, uh, all I need to do is uh, select star from connection table where user ID two is equal to the given user. So for example, A sent a request to B. So A is a follower of B. So if I want to find out B's follower, I'll need to query the second column, user ID two. And as soon as it's a bi-directional mapping, I'm adding, up, adding that particular row as well. So I'll be able to find that out as well. The problem, however, is that I'm taking two times the space that sh I should be taking. So to optimize on space, what I can do is have one Boolean column called is accepted. Now, if A and B are a connection, not a follower, that means that A sent a request to B and B accepted that particular request, I can keep the accepted flag as true. Otherwise, it will be false. Now, if I want to find out all the followers of A, if accepted flag is true, then I'll query based on use either user ID one should be equal to A or user ID two should be equal to A. If it is false, then only user ID two should be equal to A. The last set of entities that I'm going to talk about is post, comment, and like. Let's go ahead and create entities for all of them. So there'll be a post entity. Inside this post entity, we'll have an ID. Now, what is the relationship of a post with a user? One user can have multiple posts, whereas the reverse is not true. One post will be written by just one user. So let's add user ID in the post entity table. Whenever you have one to many kind of a relationship or many to one kind of a relationship, uh, add that attribute of the first entity in the dependent entity. So the first entity over here was user. So we'll have user ID inside post ID, which is the dependent one and some text to go along with it. Similarly, in comment, entity also we'll have an id comment is made by a user so it uh, comment is dependent on user id comment is also dependent on post because a comment cannot exist independently of a post so we'll also have a post id here again this is an example of a many to one kind of a relationship and it will also have text now for likes we can have two tables one is a post like table inside post like we'll have id post id again uh, one to many kind of a relationship and a user id on a comment like table we'll have the same attributes id comment id and user id if you notice here the post id and comment id are basically the entity ids that this like is made on so for example in post like the entity was post in comment like the entity was comment we can club these two tables together similar to we saw in educational and company combined table will look something like a like like will have an id it will have entity id and entity type now this entity type can be of two types presently uh, either post or comment finally we'll also have the user who has liked this particular thing if i want to add one more entity let's say a user can have uh, vlogs as well so what i'll do is i'll create a vlog table over here and in this type i'll add type equal to vlog as well so without even adding one more table, uh, my like table will work. I hope this video gave you some sense of how to design schema for big systems like LinkedIn. This is just a glimpse of what we teach and how we teach at Scalar. Lastly, we'll keep on adding videos on similar topics. Therefore, please subscribe to our channel to get notifications about new videos. Hi, I'm Mohit Yadav and I teach at Scalar. In this video, we are going to talk about Delicious, which was a site that started off as a college project and then scaled to 5 million users. In this video, we are going to learn about vertical scaling, horizontal scaling, and the challenges that comes with it. Now coming to the topic, Delicious. Delicious was a website that offered users to save bookmarks so that they can access it from any computer. The website was started in 2003 by a college student and was later acquired by Yahoo in 2005. 
This was way back when Chrome was not there and there was no bookmarking service either. By the end of 2008, the website had more than 5 million users and approximately 180 million bookmarks saved. This scaled from one laptop to 5 million users. We'll start from the day it went live on the creator's laptop. Let's start by understanding what happens when you type delicious in the browser. Now browsers do not understand the names, they only understand IP addresses. Hence, we need a way to convert this URL into an IP address. In case of delicious, DNS will return the IP address of the computer on which it is hosted. Now since every machine which is connected to internet gets an IP address, and every time we connect to internet, this IP address may change. Therefore, we need to associate a static IP which does not change when you connect to internet again and again. And we need to assign this IP to the computer. To get the whole system up and running, we first need to purchase a domain name called Delicious and then map it to the static IP of this computer. If you look closely, there are two major kind of requests involved. One is the get or the read request in form of get user bookmarks and the second one is post or write request in form of add bookmarks. Using the IP address that is returned from the DNS, both this request will go to the same computer and within the computer, there will be two things running. One is the application server which will listen to all the requests that are coming to the HTTP port 80 and the second one will be the MySQL server which will store all the bookmarks that my users are trying to save. So till now my life is good, I'm running the website for free and I'm using campus internet. My database is set up on my personal computer so I'm not paying anything for the resources and I'm making money out of ads. Soon the website became an instant hit. The user base kept on growing and the challenges also kept on piling up in the same proportion. Every time a new bookmark was created meant that there is a need for extra storage to store this particular bookmark. Now the best available hardware at that time was around 50 GB of hard disk, 128 MB of RAM. This was basically a Pentium 4 era. To keep up with the demand, he bought better hardware, meaning he bought a better laptop, a better computer. The bottom line is he bought more RAM or more hard disk or maybe multiple cores. But soon, even the best hardware available was not enough to keep up with the growing demand of the business. In fact, most companies of the era focused on upgrading their hardware to solve the growing needs of the business. This form of scaling is basically called as vertical scaling. However, Delicious founder was different. He knew in the longer run his approach will not work. Not only he will be restrained by his system resources, but he might also lose valuable customer data if his laptop crashes. This website is not reachable when his computer is turned off. Hence. This computer was a single point of failure. To overcome the challenges of vertical scaling, his friends suggested him to utilize their own laptops or computers. The idea was to uniformly distribute the incoming request to available computers. This mode where we are overcoming the scalability hurdles using multiple servers and computers is basically called as horizontal scaling. Now, we know that the client talks to the DNS to get IP address corresponding to a particular website. But the question is, the website is now running on multiple server instances. We have let's say four servers running the delicious website. Which of the four servers available should be stored in the DNS? If I randomly choose any of the available server, all the requests will go to that particular server and that server will eventually die. To fix this, have one machine whose responsibility is to route the traffic to the available instances. This machine will lie between the DNS wall and the servers that I have and the DNS configuration in the registry, I'll mention the IP address of this special machine and not of the any of the instances that I have. Now the question comes, won't this special machine also die if all the requests pass through it? The reason why this special machine will be able to handle higher traffic is because it is only routing the traffic that it is getting to one of the available instances. It is not doing any compute or memory intensive task and modern day machines can handle up to 1 million requests per second. So using this, we have solved for high number of queries per second on my system. But there is one more problem that still exists. That is single point of failure. Just like any other computer, what if my special server also dies? To solve this, we can have a standby routing server which will not serve or route any request. 
When my main server goes down, swap the main server with the standby server. But how do I swap? Should I change the IP address in the DNS registry? Doing this will take minutes. Can we do better? Mm, yes, we can. Remember, we assigned a static IP to a special server. The key here is take the static IP and assign it to the passive one. Passive one mean the standby server. The special server we just spoke about is called load balancer and we will study more about it in the upcoming videos. Hello, hi and welcome everyone to my new video on system design. I am Mohit Yadav and I teach at Scalar. I have been fortunate enough to work on systems that saw over 10 million concurrent users and I have also built data pipelines that can crunch around 1 TB of data per day. Having led teams at Nutanix and Hotstar which have built such massively scalable systems, I am here today to share the same knowledge with you all. In this video, we are going to learn about a very important system design concept called load balancing. To understand how a load balancer works, we first need to look at how a typical request flows through my entire system. A request will start from a client application. This client can be browser, a web app or maybe a mobile app. This client will call DNS to resolve the domain name that I am trying to access. For example, if I type delicious.com in the browser, the request will go to the DNS server. DNS server will give the IP address corresponding to delicious.com and it will return it back to the client. Subsequent request will then go to the IP address that is returned by the DNS. This IP address can either correspond to the application server which is capable of catering to that particular request or it might correspond to a proxy server which will act as a gateway to route request to the application servers. Since this DNS happens to be the first point of contact for almost every request on internet, this system needs to be very scalable and available. The amount of load that this system takes is immensely huge as compared to any other system in the world. Also, the latency, which is nothing but a measure of time it takes for a system to respond to a particular request, needs to be extremely low. What would be the total latency over here? If I have to calculate the total latency of the system, it would be DNS resolution plus the request time. So request time will be application dependent, but the time it takes for DNS resolution is same for every request on the internet. If this time is high, the overall latency of the system increases. So my goal as an engineer should be latency of the DNS resolution should be extremely low. And to achieve this, we try to cache the DNS mapping at various stages. What are the various stages? We try to cache it at the browser, we try to cache it at the OS, ISPs, and then we also replicate it to DNS servers. There's one more important thing. Now assume that if the DNS servers are placed at only one geographical location, let's say US, and the requests are originating from, let's say, India, it will add lot of latency because India and US are geographically apart from each other. And that's the reason this geographical distance will add to extra latency. Typically, it takes around 200 milliseconds to, uh, for a request to reach from US to India. So every request which is originating from India and is getting resolved in US will have an inherent lag of 200 milliseconds. It is not a very desirable outcome, right? So to avoid that kind of scenarios, DNS is basically replicated across the globe. And because it is replicated across the globe, updating or changing the IP address on these DNS server is not a very easy task. This change will have to be propagated to the entire world, which might take hours or even days in some cases. I have a wonderful resource in the description that you should refer to understand how a typical DNS works. Also, I would like to pause here and request you guys to please like and share this video and support our free content on system design topics and software engineering in general. Now coming back to the topic, in the example that we considered, the DNS was just returning one IP address. It will work for most of the websites in the world. but 
consider this DNS resolution to be of Google or Facebook scale. Basically a tech giant which have massive amount of queries, massive amount of user base and they process billions of queries per second. In those cases, if I just return one single IP address, chances are that all the requests of the client will hit that particular instance and there is no such instance which would be able to handle traffic of the entire world. So that machine will eventually die. To avoid this, what typically these tech giants do is they deploy multiple IPs on which the client request will resolve to, right? So instead of returning, let's say IP1, they return a list of IP. So IP1, IP2, IP3, IP4. And they send this particular list to the client. Now it is the responsibility of the client to figure out which IP to talk to. Typically, in DNS resolution phase, it tries to follow up something called as a waterfall model. What is a waterfall model? It will try to connect with the first IP. If the connection is successful, it will not connect with IP2, IP3 or IP4. If the first connection itself is successful, it will connect with the first IP. Now, if all the clients will start connecting to the first available IP, that also is not solving the problem. Even though I'm returning a list, but essentially each client is connecting to the first IP that is returned. So if I return the same IP list to every client, I will be gated by a limitation that every client will try to connect to the same IP. What DNS do is, instead of returning the list like this, they return the list in a shuffled order. Meaning that it is very much possible that user one gets a list like IP1, IP2, IP3 and so on. User 2 gets a slightly different order like IP2, IP1 and IP3. User 3 gets a list like IP3, IP2 and so on. This way I have successfully distributed the load to my available instances. right? Another way to do traffic routing is to use a geo-based routing strategy. That means people who are residing in India will get a IP address corresponding to India data center. People who are residing in US will get a IP address corresponding to US data center. That also bridges the latency gap. Why? Because if Indi user sitting in India gets a IP address uh, of the data center in US, there will be an inherent uh, lag in resolving the subsequent request. So it makes sense to have a geo-based routing strategy as well. Now we have identified the IP address which will be responsible for answering all my client requests. This could either correspond to a single server or a gateway server which will route traffic to my available servers. If we choose to route the entire traffic to a single computational server, the only way to scale is to run our application on a better hardware. However, if we choose to route traffic via gateway server, we can add more instances as and when required and adding more instances will help us cater to multiple or higher number of incoming requests. Another important advantage of this approach is that this allows application servers to keep evolving without the need to make DNS changes. Now this DNS changes, we have learned that it might take hours or even days in some cases. So if we have to update the code of my application server, all I need to do is add more application server, let's say AS1, AS2 and AS3 resistor these application server in the app, uh, in the load balancer and deregister the older ones and i have saved myself from updating the dns record if this was the one server case the ip address of that one server would have changed and i would have to update the dns mapping as well lastly one very very important benefit that we are getting out of having a gateway machine fronting my application server is that this gateway machine also provides a layer of security. How? All the machines that are below the load balancer can typically be in my private network. 
meaning these instances can typically be disconnected from internet and whenever they want to be using any data from the internet it will come only via load balancer so my load balancer is the wall that connects to the internet and my application servers just talks to the load balancer the load balancer also takes care of encrypting and decrypting the message and securing the request via https so my load balancer layer can typically be https and my application server can implement a http protocol now there are two major types of load balancer one is a hardware load balancer and the second one is a software load balancer a hardware load balancer is a specialized hardware which takes care of routing the requests that are coming to it most likely you end up using a software load balancer which can run on a commodity hardware to route traffic and this software load balancer is again divided into two types one is a layer 4 load balancer and the second one is a layer 7 load balancer this layer 4 and layer 7 translates to the osi network layer right layer 4 if you remember is a transport layer and layer 7 is basically the application layer in the transport layer the only thing that we get from the incoming request is the ip information so we only get the source ip and based on the source ip and the port in the incoming request we route the traffic to the available servers whereas in the application load balancer we get much more richer information in form of the headers that are passed in the request the query params the path params and also the http method but what are the pros and cons of using both right uh, in what cases should you use layer 4 if you look closely in the transport we only have to rely on source ip and port and based on this we route the traffic so the amount of computation that we are doing in the layer 4 uh, load balancer is less as compared to the computation that we are doing in application where we are processing the entire request so in layer 4 it will be much faster to route the request whereas in layer 7 it will wait for all network packets to arrive before deciding which server should be able to serve my incoming request but these days we are having much better hardware which are drastically reducing the slowness factor of layer 7 however there is one more distinction why you should still use layer 4 in some cases because in layer 4 we are exposing only minimal information to the load balancer we are only exposing the source ip address and nothing else hence layer 4 load balancers are slightly more secure as compared to layer 7 where we could extract the entire information about a incoming request the last thing that we want to look at is how do we even route traffic from a load balancer to my available application server load balancers keep a registry of all the available application server so it will keep as1 as2 and as3 and it will also maintain the state in which these systems are so for example as 1 2 and 3 are in available state so it will mark it with green and if there are other servers which are not in a available state it will mark it with red and request will not be routed to those servers but what should be the routing strategy our goal is to try and optimize on the resources that we have and based on the resources we should route the request one of the very trivial or the brute force way to route traffic is to send the first request to first server second to second and the third request goes to the third server the fourth request again goes to the first server fifth request goes to the second server and sixth request goes to the third server and we'll keep on doing this circular distribution of request to all the available servers in my system this kind of routing strategy is called as a round robin strategy but as you can see this is not a best strategy to go for why this is not a best strategy we can see that the application server 2 has twice the ram twice the number of cores and twice the number of disk available as compared to application server 1 and 2 therefore it should ideally process more number of request as compared to the other servers so what we can typically do is make the routing strategy in such a way that application server 2 gets approximately twice the number of request as compared to my other available servers how i can do that i'll route first request to the first application server 
second request will go to my second application server, third request will also go to the same server, fourth goes to application server 3, fifth goes to 1, 6 and 7 goes to application server 2 and 8 goes to application server 3. That way first server gets 2 requests, this gets 4 and the last server will get again 2 requests. Application server 2 is getting 50% load, application server 1 is getting 25% load and similarly application uh, server 3 is also getting 25% of the load. This kind of routing strategy is called weighted round robin. The other routing strategies worth mentioning over here is a least connection routing strategy. This least connection looks at the number of active connections that are there uh, with the application server and server with least number of active connection will get the next new incoming request. For example, if there are 5 connections to application server 1, 6 connections to application server 2 and let's say 4 connections to application server 3, the next incoming request will go to application server 3 and this number will increase to 5. As soon as this request is processed, the number will again decrement to 4. Here also, we have the same problem as in round robin strategy that we are not accounting for the capacity of the instance. To accommodate that, here also we have a weighted least connection routing strategy where you can assign weights to a particular application server and routing will be done based on that. The last strategy that I am going to talk about is basically a least response time strategy. In least response time strategy, we look at two parameters. One is the number of connection it has and the second is the average time it takes to complete a particular request. Considering these two parameters, we decide which server should cater to my next incoming request. Now, all these strategies that we have covered till now work well if every app server is equally well equipped to answer my query. Meaning that if I have a query A, I will get the same response if I send the query A to application server 1, to application server 2 or application server 3. Regardless of where this query is getting processed, I will get the same response. This kind of a system is basically called as a stateless system. The last set of routing strategy that I have not covered in this video is called a hash based routing strategy. In this hash based routing strategy, we use the source IP address or the URL and we calculate a hash out of it. We have another video on consistent hashing to explain this routing strategy in depth. So please go ahead and watch the video on consistent hashing to know more about the hash based routing strategy, right? This typically works on stateful systems. Again, stateful system and stateless systems is something that we are going to cover in the upcoming videos. So please stay tuned for that video as well. Hello, hi, and welcome everyone to my new video on system design. If you are a software engineer, chances are you would have heard about terms like stateless and stateful systems. This video is a beginner's guide to understanding these terms and have practical insights about when and where to use these systems. I'm Mohit Yadav and I teach at Scalar Academy. I've been very fortunate enough to work on systems that saw over 10 million concurrent users and have built data pipelines that can process terabytes of data per day. Now let's get started. Let's say you're building online calculator and you're asked to add two numbers. Do you appreciate that every server in the system is equally well equipped to answer this query? It doesn't really matter which user is asked to do these operations. Every server in the system will yield the exact same result. The reason each server is able to do so is because the servers are not saving any context or state. This makes every server equally favorable to answer that query. Such systems are called stateless systems because they are not storing any state, context or any data in the application server. Now let's consider another example. Let's say we are trying to build a chatbot this time and one user sends a query asking for restaurants that are nearby his location. The chatbot first saves this message in the memory and then responds with a list of restaurants nearby. It then asks the same user to pick one restaurant out of the list. Now the user let's say choose third restaurant 
and if this request goes to the same application server it will be able to return relevant information since it has context about the previous chat history however if this request goes to some other server that server will not be able to comprehend the message properly due to the absence of previous conversation history therefore in such systems the context of the conversation really matters this context can be decoupled from the application server by simply adding a storage layer to save the messages such systems where the context or the state lies within the application server are called stateful systems now that we understand what are stateless and stateful systems let's take a moment to appreciate the pros and cons of each system we'll start off with stateless systems which are very easier to scale the reason is that each server in the stateless system is equally well equipped to handle the request thereby if the load on my system increases i can just add or remove servers in the system and my entire infrastructure will work just fine these systems are also resilient to server failures because there is no state which is maintained at the server and even if one server goes down there is no actual loss of data and the lost server we can just replace it with a new one and my system as a whole will work as expected however most of the systems that you will design will need to store some state in some way or the another if you want to keep the system stateless chances are that you will store this data or the state in a storage layer now querying this data will involve a network io call this operation will drastically slow down your system performance because you are involving a network io call reading the data from your application server will be slower as compared to doing a network call and fetching the data from the storage layer now let's compare this with the stateful systems since the context or the state of data required to answer client queries reside within the application the latency of stateful system is much lower as compared to the stateless ones however these systems are not resilient to server failures if one of the system goes down the data that was residing in the application goes down with it hence it makes sense to store either the derived data or the data which is actually very short lived because of this it is also harder to scale right it is quite difficult to scale such systems because with the increasing number of request we will have to transfer some amount of state from one server to newly added server this might sound trivial but in reality it poses many risk associated with distributed systems you would have heard somewhere that stateless systems are beautiful and software engineers should always try to design their systems to be stateless this is true in most of the cases right uh, because we can just add or remove machines and the load of the entire system will be uniformly distributed however in some cases it is essential to store the data locally in the application server as well especially in cases where the state is very short lived i'll give you one very good example let's say you're designing a multiplayer game like pubg if you store the state of a particular match in a separate storage layer the latency of the entire system would be huge imagine somebody shooting someone in the game that state is stored in a separate db and it is propagated to multiple uh, users who are also playing the same game and they are reading from the db it will take there will be a lot of lag hence the latency of such systems needs to be very low so what we do is we store the state of such applications in the application server itself also it is important to note that the state of a pubg match is very transitive we will not need this information once the match has ended hence in such cases stateful systems makes more sense in nutshell just like any other system design concept deciding which system to go for depends upon the use case in hand ever wondered how games like pubg scales horizontally We learned that designing a game like PUBG would require us to save the state in the application server itself. We also saw that this state is very short lived. To understand why, let us see what information we are storing about the game. Every game will have players and each player will have to store their location on the map, their health, weapons and the team information that they are playing in. we need to store this information only till the match is live once the match has ended we can destroy this particular information because it does not make sense if we store this information in a database we'll end up wasting a lot of time why because we'll have to query the database every time a person request for the match state 
and this is an IO call, network IO call, which will waste a lot of time. Hence, it is critical to store this information in the application server itself. Now, in order for a match to work seamlessly, all players of a particular match must be routed to the same application server. Else, they won't be able to find the relevant data for that particular match. To achieve this, what we can do is, we can assign a match ID and ask our client to send this match ID whenever they are making a request. They can send it as a path param, they can send it as a header, they can also send it as a query param. The thing to note here is that the load balancer must ensure routing the traffic based on this match ID. In simple words, if the first request for let's say match ID 2 goes to server 1, all the subsequent requests of same match ID must be routed to server 1 only. Which algorithm can be used to distribute this traffic? Well, in this video, we are going to discuss one such approach. We are also going to look at its pitfall and build intuition for the upcoming video on consistent hashing. I am Mohit Yadav and I teach in Scalar Academy. I have been fortunate enough to work on scale at Hotstar and Nutanix where I build systems which has massive read and write volumes. One of the reasons behind doing this system design primer series is to impart the knowledge that I have gained over the past one decade and help budding software engineers get better at architecting systems. Now coming back to the topic, remember our goal was to distribute the load in such a way that all the requests with same match ID must be routed to the same server. Match ID 2, server 1, all subsequent requests of match ID 2 going to server 1. The second point was that the load should be uniformly distributed. Meaning if I have n servers, load on each server must be equal to or must be nearly equal to 1 by n. And finally, I should be able to add or remove instances from the cluster. Why? Because that is the essence of horizontal scaling. I don't want to build an infra where I have constant number of machines. My load on the system can increase or decrease. Depending upon that, the number of servers in my cluster can increase or decrease. The first strategy, if I have to think about the approach, the first strategy that comes to my mind is that I have a match ID and if I have to route traffic to each of the servers evenly, the basic strategy that comes to my mind is that I can simply take a mod of match ID with the number of servers, which is n. This number will signify which server will process my request. Let's take a few match IDs to see how exactly this is going to happen if we have three servers running. Let's say the match ID is 11, 11 mod 3 is 2, 42, 42 mod 3 is 0, so it will be routed to the 0th server, 34 mod 3 is 1, so it will be routed to 1st server, similarly 53 mod 3 is 1, 63 mod 3 is 0, which will be routed to 1 and 0th server respectively. We see that the above approach will satisfy my first two goals. Let's dig a little deeper to find out what will happen if we add one more server. Now my number of servers or n becomes 4. So let's consider all the examples, all the match IDs that I took in the previous case where n was equal to 3. So now since n is equal to 4, 11 mode 4 will become 3, 42 mode 4 will become 2, 34 mod 4 will again be 2, 53 mod 4 is 1 and 63 mod 4 is 3. Now let's consider the other case where we are removing one instance from the cluster. 11 mod 2, 1, 42 mod 2, 0, 34 mod 2, again 0 and 53 mod 2 is 1, 63 mod 2 is again 1. Now what is happening here? Let's consider the first case if the match ID is equal to 11 which was getting routed to server 2 when we had 3 servers will now be routed to server 3 when we add a new instance. 
unless we transfer the data which is already residing in server 2 to server 3, our users will not be able to get the match information. And as we can clearly see from the examples that we took above, whenever there is a change in the number of servers, a majority portion of the keys will be distributed to the new servers. And this by no means is an ideal behavior. We need a way to minimize the need of data transfer whenever we decide to add or remove instances. Now before winding up, I would like to give you a home assignment. That's a maths puzzle. The puzzle goes like this. Consider initially there are M servers in the cluster and you can add or remove servers from the clusters. Let's say you do some add or remove operation and the final number now becomes N. This N can be greater than N, meaning that I have added new servers in the cluster or it can be less than M which means that I have removed few servers from my cluster. What you have to do is you have to write an equation using which you can find out the amount of data that will be moved. Write your answers in the comment section and we'll see who gets it right. I hope you all get an idea about basic approach for load balancing in stateful systems. We will look at a better approach which is consistent hashing in the upcoming video. How do you distribute the load evenly in stateful systems? In the last video, we saw one such approach where we used the modulo hashing. The approach works perfectly fine until we decide to add or remove the instances. Whenever we want to add the instances, a majority portion of the keys needs to be rehashed. In this video, we are going to look at a better approach called consistent hashing. I am Mohit Yadav and I teach in Scalar Academy. Now coming back to the topic, let's have a look at the problem statement again. Our problem statement is that we need a distribution scheme that does not directly depend on the number of servers so that whenever we want to add or remove servers, the number of keys that needs to be relocated is minimized. To understand the solution, let's visualize a circle with marking 0 to a very large number, let's say 10 to the power 18. And we'll call this particular ring or a circle as a consistent hashing ring. Then we'll take two hash functions, which will basically generate keys in the range of 0 to 10 to the power 18. Let's call them HS and HC. The HS hash function will be used to mark servers on the consistent hashing ring. The HC hash function can be used to mark partition key or the client ID on the same consistent hashing ring. Now to find out on which server a given key needs to be routed, we need to locate the key on the circle and then move in the counterclockwise direction to find the server. Now there are two main problems with this approach. First, uneven distribution. The server which is located at the max distance in the counterclockwise direction will get the most number of requests. And the second one is the weighted routing where we might have a scenario where one server has twice the number of resources as the other servers. In that case, we need to ensure that the servers with more resources gets more number of requests. To solve for the other problems, what can we do? We can assign many labels to each server. So now instead of having labels A, B, C for three servers that we had, we'll have server labels between A0 to A9, B0 to B9, C0 to C9, all marked in the same circle. Now if server B is twice as powerful as the rest, it could be assigned twice as many labels. As a result, it would end up holding twice as many objects on an average basis. This way, we can be sure that the keys are evenly distributed and server with better resources are holding more amount of data. Now, let's see what happens when we remove one server. Imagine that server C is now removed. To account for this, we must remove all the labels between C0 to C9 from the circle that we had, uh, the circle which was basically representing the consistent hashing ring. This results in the object keys reassigned to server A and B. Whatever keys were residing in server C 
will now be reassigned to server B and C respectively. But what happens with the other object keys? The ones that originally belong to A and B? The answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. And that's the beauty of consistent hashing. The absence of CX label does not affect the keys in any way. So removing a server results in the object keys being randomly assigned to the rest of the server, leaving all the other keys untouched. And if you notice closely, all servers are still holding one by n amount of data. Earlier also, they were holding one by n. When they had three servers, they were holding the one third of the data. And then when we removed one server, every server is holding 50% of the data. Now, consistent hashing is used to uniformly distribute the data in stateless systems like Kafka, Cassandra, etc. It's also a very powerful tool that finds its application in the stateful uh, servers as well as it is a way of implementing sticky sessions in the load balancer. I hope you got an idea about what consistent hashing is, how it works. Hi, my name is Anshuman and I'm one of the co-founders at Scalar Academy. If you are new to tech, and you have recently heard the term caching and don't know what it means, then this video is for you. I was fortunate to see scale at Facebook. I was fortunate to be part of teams that built products that scale to millions of queries per second and billions of users. I'm here to share some of those learnings with you. All right, so I'll try to explain caching as as simple examples as possible. By the way, there is a bonus problem at the end of this video. So please do stay till the end of the video to look at the solution of that. All right, so let's imagine that you want to make milk tea. One obvious ingredient of milk tea is milk itself. And uh, milk I find in most grocery stores, department stores that are around me. So one obvious way whenever I'm making milk tea is that I go to the department store, fetch milk from here, and then make my milk tea. This to and fro process, by the way, ends up taking a lot of time. However, one thing which strikes me is, by the way, I can buy a refrigerator. I can buy a fridge which stays in my house only, where I can buy a few milk cartons at a time, and I can store it here. And when I'm making a milk tea now, then as long as there is some milk present in the fridge, I can use it from here. If there is no milk present in the fridge, then I go to the department store and I buy the next set of cartons of milk. So what I have done, what have I done in the process? I, I could still have gotten milk from department store. It's the same milk. However, I created this temporary storage, which is close to me, which is much faster for me to be able to store those milk so that I can make my milk tea faster. Plus then I have more motivation to make milk tea because I have it in my fridge. Very similarly, if you look at the design world, distributed systems world, you always have these systems that are looking for some or the other information, right? So machines talk to each other, they, they query for information. Imagine you load your Facebook profile page. That profile page would, would need to show your name, email ID, your friends, et cetera, et cetera. So for that, it would need a lot of information. So these, this machine would then ask for profile information for yours, which would be there in some other machine in the hard disk. And reading from hard disk is slow. If you would have noticed, when you transfer movies, et cetera, from, from your friend's laptop, those movies are written to your hard disk and those hard disk writes are fairly slow. Very similarly, reading from the hard disk is also slow, especially if, if your data is lying somewhere you don't know where. So you'll have to search through the index to find where this profile information is and then fetch that data from there. However, if the same information was in RAM somehow, which is main memory, then accessing that would be faster. However, I mean, if, if we're talking about Facebook, Facebook has so many people, so many profiles, all information cannot reside in RAM. It has to be in the hard disk, which is the same as me going to the department store every single time when I want to make milk tea. However, if I know that there are, let's say, certain profile pages that are fetched very often, that are more likely to be fetched than the other profile pages, 
then maybe I can create a fridge, a refrigerator where I can store the information of these pages. So that when somebody asks for these pages, then I don't go to the departmental store, which is the hard disk in this case. Maybe I have that information in RAM or a faster memory access. I mean, let's not say RAM. Some place where I can find that information faster than actually having to read from the hard disk of a different machine. That process is called caching. Caching is exactly what I did with my refrigerator to department store. It is exactly doing that to reduce the latency of fetching that information in some cases. A cache will never be as big as your total storage. There will always be cases when I run out of milk in my refrigerator or when the information is not present in this fast storage. And that process, by the way, this is caching. And when I find data in my cache, it's called a hit. When I do not find the data because it is not present, therefore I'll have to go to the departmental store or go and read from this hard disk. That is called miss. So whenever you find data in the cache, it's a hit. You don't find it, it's miss. That is caching. And caching is something, by the way, you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. In, for example, you might have noticed that when you load a website for the first time, it's usually slower. But when you refresh, it loads faster. Sometimes when your internet is not working, you keep refreshing after a while, and eventually the website loads. Your internet doesn't get faster. That's not the reason why it loads. It loads because once, let's say there, is, there was an image on the website. Once that image has loaded, that means your browser has now gotten that milk, carton of milk. So it caches that in its own memory. On your browser, on Chrome, it gets cached. So next time when you load the same website with the same image, the browser doesn't go and fetch the entire image from the other website. It only checks if it was the same image. If it was the same image, then it fetches it from its local memory, which means I don't have to go over that slow internet to fetch that image. And therefore by using caching, I have significantly reduced the latency of fetching that data. That is caching with your browser. Systems within also do caching in various forms. <clears throat> One simple question I have. If you haven't seen my cap theorem video, please go and see that because this question is slightly based on that. Imagine you are building a very consistent system. You would want that if you're doing caching, then this cache data is, is exactly consistent and exactly the same as the data present in your hard disk for whatever entries it has. If you're building a consistent system and you're doing caching there, there, when I ask you to update, how do you go about updating um, such a system? In the context of the departmental store and milk tea example, let me say, let's, let's say that you want your milk tea to always use the latest milk that is present in the department store or always use the milk that is present in the department store. How do you validate that the milk that you have in fridge as of now is the ex exactly the same milk that is present in the department store. How do you do that? <clears throat> there is something called as, uh, well, actually, if you look at uh, how you would do it, there are only two ways of doing it, right? One is when you tell me that, hey, here is new milk to restock your store with, or here is new data, right? Like, which is, let's say, and on my profile name, for some reason, my name changes. So whenever there is data pertaining to me that is being updated, it does not go directly to the hard disk. Imagine this is my hard disk or hard disk storage, and here is cache. Whenever this update operation comes, it goes through the cache. So first I check, is this entry present in the cache, which is, is my name, is my profile cached? If it is cached, then I first update the entry in the cache, and then I update the entry in the hard disk. And only then, when both of them have been updated, only then I return success. 
This is called write through cache. Which means whenever new milk comes to the department store, it goes through me. It goes through, through my house. I do a verification and only then I let the milk pass. That is right through cash. Or the other way could be that if the database is aware of where my caching system is, whenever there is a profile update, the database tells cache to throw away whatever information I have regarding my profile because that is now out of date. And only once invalidation has been done, only this write has been done, invalidation has been done, only then you return success. Or in the context of, again, departmental stores as well as um, milk, let's say whenever my department stores gets a new kind of milk, they call me up and they say, hey, look, please throw away the milk that you have in your refrigerator. It is old now. We have a newer quality of milk. And that way I make sure I'm always cooking my milk tea with the newest quality of milk that I have in the market. That way I stay consistent. That was all for me for today. I hope again, caching made sense to you. You understood why caching happens in systems. Hi, my name is Anshuman and I'm one of the co-founders at Scalar Academy. If you're a techie, chances are you would have heard about Cat Theory. Today we would talk about what C, A and P in CAP theorem stand for, why it works the way it does, and what does CAP theorem mean in the modern ecosystem. I was fortunate to see tech at scale at Facebook and was able to design products that served millions of queries per second and billions of users. I'm here to share a few of those learnings with you. All right, so let's first look at why do we even need to learn CAP theorem. CAP theorem is one of the most basic principles of uh, distributed storage. So if, if at all you think about building or working on distributed systems in the future, CAP theorem is a must have, must know. So that's why you need to learn CAP theorem. Now, before I get into explaining CAP theorem, and I would try to do that with using as simple example as possible, I want to get give credit to Kaushik, whose uh, blog I have borrowed a few ideas from. Uh, so thank you, Kaushik, for coming up with a very, very innovative example. So let's get to it, right? So to elaborate um, CAP theorem, I'll, I'll take example of, of a real world example of, of, let's say, you. Imagine I am an entrepreneur. I'm looking for ideas and I feel, you know what, like people need reminders. Let's build a service that just stores reminders, right? Which is, I get this very premium number. Imagine I name my company as ABCD. And I get this very premium number, which is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. People could just call me on one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and they can tell me what they want to remember. And then when they call me back, I tell them what they wanted to remember and then things work. It seems to me that this is a great idea. So what I do is I set up this line. I, I sit in the office. Imagine this is me, forgive my drawing. <laughs> um, imagine I sit in the office. Every time somebody tells me, let's say I got a call from X and X says, hey, please remember that I have a flight tomorrow at 9 p.m. I say, great. Next time they call and they ask me, tell me what I wanted you to remember. And then I tell them, you know what? Do you have a flight tomorrow at 9 p.m.? And then this seems great. I charge people very nominal amount of money to, to store this information and service takes off. Everybody needs this. There's a big market. Everybody starts using it. And then I start to hit the problem. And you'll notice most systems, they start to hit the problem when they hit scale. Then I realize that I'm getting a lot of calls and I'm not enough to address all of those calls myself. So then I start to think. And then I think, sure, let me, let me get my wife also involved. So now this number actually has me and my wife. Both of us, both of us sit with our diaries where the call gets routed to either one of us, whoever is free. And when I get a call, I just very quickly, if the person is asking me to take a reminder, I just take down that reminder, right? And when the person calls me back, I respond back to the reminder. Great. I have suddenly now doubled my capacity. If I was able to do take 1000 requests in a day before, now I can take 2000 requests because I have my wife to help me as well. Very soon I got my first unhappy customer. Mr. X calls me one day and says, hey, can you please remind me when is my flight? 
and I look through my diary and I realize I don't have an entry corresponding to Mr. X. And I tell Mr. X, hey, look, I don't have an entry corresponding to you. Corresponding to you. Mr. X seems very disappointed, very angry, and then disconnects the call. Now I start to think, what might have happened? Either Mr. X was delusional, or maybe there was a fault at my end. And then I see that there might have been a problem. It is possible when X, Mr. X wanted to store their reminder, they might have called my wife. And my wife would have stored this entry that, hey, X wants a reminder for a flight at 7 p.m. tomorrow. However, that entry is not with me because that call never came to me. However, when X wanted to understand when their flight was, they ended up calling me instead of my wife because they don't know. They only know this number, 1234, 1234. And I don't have that entry. And this is why X is very unhappy. This is what is called as consistency problem, data consistency problem, which is an end consumer might have stored some data with me, which and when they ask me back, there is no guarantee that they will get the data back because it depends on where the request comes to. If the request comes to my wife, they'll get their data back. If the request comes to me, they'll not get the data back. If my wife's diary has that entry, this is a big problem. If not solved, my company will die. So I start to think, I start to think, and I come up with a solution. I say, hey, look, I mean, here is what we could do. When X calls me, to say that, please note down that I have a flight tomorrow at, imagine, 6 p.m. I'll note it down in my diary. I'll also tell my wife to note down this entry, which is also that tomorrow, 6 p.m. flight. And only when both of us have written it, the entry in my diary, in their own diaries, then I return success. Then I tell Mr. X, I have noted down your entry. That way, there is guarantee that both of our diaries, my diary and my wife's diary, they'll have the exact same entries. Consistency of data. They'll have the exact same entries. And great, my consistency problem is solved. Now, when X calls any one of us, we, we can respond back with the right data points. Things were going great. One day, I again start to face a problem. One day, my wife calls in sick. She's not keeping well, so she's not in the office. What that means is that... My wife, for the time being, is gone. For a day, is gone. And at that very moment, this another gentleman, Y, calls me and tells me to note down an entry. I say, okay, sure, what's your entry? And they tell me, you know what, I have a flight tomorrow at 3 p.m. I say, great, let me note it down. Let me, by the way, also go and tell my wife to note it down. Oh, by the way, my wife is not here. She can't note it down. And therefore, I'll have to tell why that, hey, I can't note down your request. Your request actually has failed, which means for the entire day, I can't take in any new requests. That is a availability problem, which is my system is not available to take all kinds of right requests. In the case of software systems, for example, like Facebook, you could think of Facebook saying that for an entire day or for an hour or for a few minutes, you can't make any new posts or you can't post any new photos on, on Facebook. That is a, an availability problem. So again, I'm very stressed. What do I do? I don't want my business to fail. So I think and think and think, and I come up with another solution. I say, you know what? When my wife is not here, so I have my diary. And imagine my wife is not here. So I have written a bunch of entries. This new day comes. Whatever entries I get, Mr. X says to note down something, I'll note it down. When Mr. Y says to note down something, I'll note it down. And when my wife returns back, because I want both of our diaries to be identical. I tell her, look, you'll not take up any phone calls till you have noted down all of the additional entries that I made in the previous day. Or if she was gone for the last two days, then in the previous two days. So you first note down all of the additional entries and then you start taking calls. And then my problem is solved. Now, because if, if X calls me and says that, please note down that I have a flight tomorrow at 8 p.m. Even if my wife is not in the office, I can still note down the entry and therefore I'm still available. Since my wife will come back and she'll, she will actually catch up with whatever new entries are there in my diaries before answering any phone call. So we're also consistent, which is great. Things are going super good. And then comes another problem. One day, me and my wife, we both have fight and we stop talking to each other. So imagine I get a phone call, X says, Hey, look, please note down. I have a flight tomorrow at 9 p.m. I can't note it down because I'm not able to talk to my wife. And if if I note it down, then and say, tell X that, hey, look, I have noted down your entry. 
then my system becomes inconsistent right because my diary has now different entries my wife has different entries and she is still taking calls so when this network partition happens when this network partition happens where i am not able to talk to my wife or other systems then i have to make a choice do i want to stay consistent or do i want to say available if i want to stay consistent then if mr x calls me and says please note down the entry i will have to say sorry i can't my system is down it's not accepting any new write requests if i want to stay available then i can take down the entry but then i become inconsistent so i if i choose consistency then i become unavailable if i choose availability then i become inconsistent and that is exactly the caps theorem caps theorem says that if you have consistency if you have availability and if you have partition tolerance then at a time you can only guarantee two out of these you can't promise all three at the same time which means when this network partition happens i would have to choose between consistency and availability i can't have both that's the gap theorem now i have two bonuses to add here most systems that are available and partition tolerant which is called ap a for availability p for partitioning c for consistency right most systems that are ap can still make sure that they become eventually consistent what does that mean that means eventually my and my wife's diary they have same entries how do i make sure of that whenever we start talking again we can exchange notes think i mean or maybe just imagine that there is a clerk here that i've hired who just takes up all of the new entries in the last one hour tells me what those entries were so i take those down also by the way ask me what were the entries that i made in the last one hour goes back to my wife and tells here are the new entries that were made in the last one hour so there might be periods in between that i was inconsistent but eventually we become consistent so that is eventually consistency there is one more um, extension to cap theorem that was done very recently actually not very recently about 10 years back um which is called as pacelc theorem and what this theorem states is that you know when network partition happens when my systems can't talk to each other then sure you have to choose between availability or consistency you can't have both however there are going to be cases when my systems can talk to each other which means there is there is no network partition which is else so else i have to choose between latency or consistency i can't have both if you notice when i made this decision that to stay consistent i will make sure that on every single call i will make sure my wife also notes down the entry and only then i return success then i am actually waiting for my wife to note down that entry my wife could be doing something else at that time my wife could be answering some other call and in that case it the entire request might end up taking a lot of time so the latency could become high because i want consistency however if i was willing to let go of consistency which is i wanted to say that hey look i'll just note it down and maybe i mean my my wife could probably catch up later on then latency could stay really low so then you would actually have a balance between latency and consistency when there is no network partition so that's what pace lc theorem is which is just an extension to the cap theorem because cap theorem does not talk about latency i hope that made sense to you and i hope that was helpful this cap theorem is one of the most basic and one of the most useful theorems you'll come across when designing distributed systems i'll keep doing more videos like this if you like this video please like the current video and subscribe to the channel thank you thank you so much hello everyone welcome to this session on system design primarily uh, objective of this round is to help you guys tell you about what kind of questions you can expect in system design round and more importantly how do you answer in a particular uh, system design round so we'll take one example we'll discuss one framework around what should be the ideal framework around discussing such questions all right then let's get started so the agenda like uh, first le let me give you a brief about why you know these system design topics are important they have importance in two areas right one is your ongoing job and the other one is the interviews so whenever uh, specifically it makes sense for people who have higher experience 
right people who are coming from let's say 2 3 years of experience they are expected to have some knowledge about system design right so system design encompasses two com- main components one is the low level design uh, wherein you will be expected to either write the schema or maybe design the apis or maybe uh, design the class like what are classes and interfaces how would you design that particular uh, code and the other one is uh, having a broader perspective of how different components are going to behave so typically to have uh, you'll basically get around one hour or uh, maybe uh, some more time to discuss a particular system in detail uh, during your interviews so uh, it's best to follow this particular framework i have followed this particular framework in for facebook and i've i was able to crack facebook with this particular framework and whenever you apply also your recruiter will also tell you about the frame uh, same framework that i'm going to be telling you so without wasting more time uh, let me just introduce the framework to you guys and then maybe if you have any questions you can type it down uh, in the comment section i'll read the questions from there right so the framework has five steps it's a five step framework you always start with gather requirements right so your first step should be to gather or ask clarifying questions about the requirements most of the time i'll give you uh, side by side whenever i'm giving you the framework i'll also give you one example and correlate how if for this particular question what should be the ideal answer or ideal output so uh, let's suppose i am asked to design a url shortener right let's suppose i appear for a facebook interview and uh, my interviewer ask me that hey you need to design a url shortener now this by itself will basically give you some hints about how you should typically approach the problem even if the problem is 100% clear to you you must ask some clarifying questions most of the time the problem will be vague enough that you will have to ask uh, you know clarifying questions but even if the problem is crisp clear just reiterate the problem in the same uh, you know in your words so that you and the interviewer are on the same page right so gather requirement step will basically for example if i'm asked to build a url shortener for me the requirements can be do i need to add personalization or do i need to add support for analytics do i need to support um, things like uh, expiry of a particular uh, long url if somebody uses my service and give a i give a particular short response for how long should i persist that particular short uh, url to long url mapping that is also a business statement and that uh, will dictate how my design will uh, look like so it is important to ask such clarifying questions in the gather requirement phase now i hope uh, the first point is clear to everyone let's move to the second point which is uh, once you have got an idea or got a sense of uh, the requirements that you will be building out just write that write all those requirements down on a piece of paper or google doc or anywhere right uh, if you are doing it on a whiteboard you try write uh, the requirements freeze the requirements on the whiteboard it is important to note here that do not spend lot of your time on this particular part gather requirements part maybe one or maximum 2 3 minutes on this particular aspect right after that you need to spend time on estimating the scale now there are multiple sub sections to estimating scale the sense or the idea that i'm trying to get out of estimate scale is now this is also one uh, one more area just like gather requirements your interviewer will work with you to un- uh, to basically give you the requirements you'll give certain assumptions the interviewer will say yes or no right or maybe you can ask your ask question to the interviewer and he'll give you the answer for that for estimate scale also for example if you don't know what is what your starting point is just ask how many daily active users are going to be there so for example i was asked to design a url short now i asked my interviewer how many users are going to use it uh, or how many daily active users are going to use it so let's suppose my interviewer said that there will be 1 million uh, users which will be uh, which i can expect to use my service so in the estimation scale step what i need to do is i need to convert this 1 million daily active users to find out how much storage is going to be required to convert these 1 million daily active users now my interviewer also to- tells me or i tell him that uh, the hey, i am assuming that 90% of my users will just read the data and only 
ten percent of the users will write the data, right? Now this is a one assumption that I'm making. I'll I'll uh, you know express this particular uh, assumption to my interviewer, and based on what he, uh, whether he says it's a fair assumption or not, I'll change these numbers. But for our system, let's say let's suppose these are the numbers. So ten percent right means that one million into ten percent, which means around hundred k users are going to write something on my are going to generate data on a daily basis. Now, what is the data that these guys are generating? These guys will be generating will give me the big URL. I'll have to somehow do some transformational magic here and return a small URL in return. This big URL can be let's say hundred characters, and this short URL can be ten characters, right? So this is the kind of transformation that I need to do. Let's suppose to uh, store the entire record. I can store it using one KB of space. So what is the daily space that I'm going to need? In the bare minimum get, uh, daily space that I'm going to need for my system, it will be one KB of data. For one record, because one record is taking one KB, multiplied it by the number of users that I'm getting who are generating the data on my website. How many such users are there? There are hundred K. So this is ten to the power five, which is something around ten to the power five, ten three MB, around hundred MB of data, right? This is on a daily basis. So Bhagya Rana says that it should be one million into ten to the power, you know, uh, into one KB. It wouldn't be one million. The reason it will not be one million is because only ten percent of my users are generating that particular data. Not all of them are generating the data. The people who are generating the data that means they they are using my service to shorten a particular URL. Only those users will be considered. Hence, I've taken hundred K users, right? Which uh, which basically means that I'll be storing around 100 MB of generating around 100 MB uh, of data, and if I have to calculate for a particular year, one particular year, then it will be 365. I'll have to multiply it by 365, which would be around 3.65 or 36.5 GB of data. On a yearly basis, my service is going to be producing this. Why am I not taking the read uh, into consideration while storage? Because I'm only storing whenever you are uh, a person is requesting a shorter URL for a long URL that I've got. Only then I have to store that particular URL. What happens when a person reads uh, wants to read that particular URL to a big URL? If uh, a request comes for reading this particular URL. I'll go to the storage. I'll read whatever is the corresponding big URL, and I'll return it back to the user. So in that, I don't need any storage, right? So the second step, which was estimating the scale, the most important thing is to estimate how much storage you are going to require, because this number, this thirty-five or thirty-six GB number that I've got here, tells me that only one instance uh, can basically hold this particular data. The entire data for one year can fit into one machine itself. If this would have been around one TB or more than one TB, I would have uh, required multiple machines to store that particular data, and hence I would require uh, more. Uh, since I require more uh, machines, I would require some sort uh, some sort of a uh, sharding. Right? But in our case, we have seen that it it is just uh, around 36 GB of data. One instance can handle it. There are still problems. We'll come to what are the problems. But uh, I'm just giving you what are the numbers that we need to take care of, right? So coming back to our important parameters for estimating scale. First was with the storage. The other important parameter is to identify the TPS of your system. That means how many requests are you getting per second? That includes of right TPS. Right TPS would be that a person is giving you a long URL, and you need to return a short URL for that. A read request, a read request in this scenario would be a person is giving a short URL and you have to return a long URL. So you need to find out the TPS of every system. TPS, uh, the full form of TPS is throughput per second. People call it QPS as well. Uh, QPS is query per second. Some people call it reads per second, writes per second, and by forgetting it, basically the crux is that you need to find out how many, what would be the number of requests for reads, what would be the number of requests for writes. Because 
if these numbers are also very high let's suppose you are getting 1 million reads per second that means that you need to have some sort of a caching enabled you need to have some replication enabled because one server will not be able to cater to 1 million io calls so there is a network bandwidth limitation as well this is the reason why you should estimate the tps as well i hope that makes sense now let's move to the third important part which is once you have estimated the scale then you look for what are your design goals what should you solve for in this particular problem design goals uh, if i have to just give you an idea about what design typical design goals are if you have not uh, heard about a uh, cap theorem just go to our youtube you know there's a playlist on system design go to that playlist and see all the uh, you know primer content so there's a theorem called cap theorem which states that uh, either in a in a scenario of a partition tolerance you can only have either consistency or availability if you're taking the partition tolerance into account so one of the design goals is to identify whether your system you're designing for a very consistent heavy heavy system or are you okay with eventual consistency and you prefer availability on that particular scenario so identifying that is one part let's talk about the uh, case that we are building do we need at most con uh, consistency uh, if i just have to explain consistency in two lines consistency states that if there are two data nodes let's say there is data node 1 and data node 2 now if the value of x is let's say initially x is 5 in both the cases then i uh, get a write request which basically updates the value of x to 50 and let's say that particular value was written in data node 1 now if i fire a read request depending upon whether it is going to data node 1 or data node 2 15 or 5 would be written in a strongly uh, consistent system we'll get 15 as the response in a weakly or a in a eventually consistent system i may get 15 or 5 both depending upon whatever is the output so do i need at most kind of, like do i require my system that every node uh, every data node in my system should have the exact same data the answer is no uh, because there are very less updates i'm just adding whenever i generate a big url once it is copied you know once it is added into the database i'm not uh, modifying it so either the date value will not be there or if the value is there it will be same for all the cases right so i don't need consistency i can live with uh, eventual consistency do i need availability i don't want if i have generated a particular url and i have sent it to you know millions of people let's say it was a google io event or maybe uh, you know donald trump or maybe uh, modi ji giving some speech and uh, to that link to that particular speech i have uh, let's say shortened it using my service and i've sent it to multiple places if those people are not able to you know reliably see the output or reliably able to access my service in that case it will be a massive hit on my website and the credibility of my website hence i cannot let go of the availability part right so design goals mein you need to identify this that whether you need consistency or should you prefer availability in case of a partition tolerance partition tolerance we've seen uh, you know we in most of the cases you know you would require some sort of a partition right so that was the, my third part designing having the design goals you first identify which what what trade off you will have consistency versus availability trade off and the second trade off is between latency right what is the kind of latency are you looking at so let me just write it down and then i'll explain what latency means now different systems would have different requirements for having uh, different requirements for latency For example, the URL shortener one that I have given you. Uh, if I give you, uh, if somebody give, you know types a shortened URL into the browser and then tries to access the bigger you know uh, URL, if that particular takes uh, time, uh, if the lookup itself takes a lot of time, it will not be a very good indicator on the uh, website because let's suppose it was basically a URL representing one particular event. now it's not a very good customer experience if they are just spending on the resolution resolution time right uh, i'm further slowing down the service of the end provider so i don't since i don't want that i need the system to be very low latency driven 
right but it is not uh, like people might think that we would need such kind of latencies in every scenario but that is not a case right all the batch systems for example if you build that can have higher latency when you sign up for netflix for example it asks you that hey well, what are your choices do you like to you know select some movies that you like watching and based on that they give you some recommendation on the uh, once you open the netflix home page now the reason the same thing happens with uh, spotify as well for those systems the latency can be high like it, it is still bounded by some seconds maybe 10 or 15 seconds but it's higher as compared to uh, you know the signing up on netflix the, you enter your email you enter your password and you're done so depending upon the system you are building you might have varying level of latency and we, by varying level of latency you can decide whether you want to build a system which is a batch system or do you need a real time processing system so i'm taking a very simple example but i hope you are getting at the point that the using the same methodology you can solve really complex problems as well by the way if you are interested in a very complex problem also uh, we take master classes uh, those are free uh, completely free you can join us at uh, in one of the master classes it's a slightly longer format hence we get to you know pick up slightly difficult topics than designing a uh, you know a url short map so if you are interested in you know let's say building youtube ingestion pipeline that is going to happen tomorrow right so you can attend that i'll be taking a youtube how, how does youtube delivers its data to millions of customers which are globally distributed uh, i'll take a session on that uh, on sunday so you can attend such kind of sessions that will have a little more complexity as compared to what we are doing right now this is the link for the master class so anyone who's interested can attend the master class on sunday it happens uh, on sunday 5 pm right there will be couple of more master classes which are listed uh, we take master classes on uh, data structures as well we take you know master classes on the system design aspects as well cool so coming back to our original problem coming back to our original framework so we have discussed the design goals part of it the next part of it is the so before i uh, tell you the uh, about the next part how do you typically build a system right uh, you don't for example if you have to run a marathon you don't uh, you know directly participate in a marathon you maybe start uh, to walk for a longer distance and then maybe you start building up stamina then you run 5 kilometers then 10 kilometers and then maybe you run for a uh, 42 kilometer marathon similarly similarly in a uh, design system design uh, concept as well whenever you're designing a particular system assume that everything uh, right from you know your storage requirements your tps requirements that uh, we have identified in the step 2 all those requirements can fit in a single machine why do we make this particular assumption this assumption is made because if you keep everything in a single box that means you can have any kind of flexibility the only thing that is reduced now is all the problem is uh, or all the data can fit into single machine which means you can use rds there is no need of optimization or anything like that we'll identify what are the bottlenecks and we'll iteratively build on top of it uh, we'll iteratively remove all the bottlenecks so the last uh, or the fourth point is basically you design for a single server whenever you're designing for a single server you need to take care of db schema this is our uh, the b um ms based db schema don't directly jump to any no sql uh, system it's a major red flag right so even if you have worked you know thoroughly on cassandra or maybe redis or maybe any other database it's a red flag if you directly jump the, uh, to that particular uh, that particular database always start with rdbms based schema right once you have started with rdbms uh, based schema then you move to uh, designing the apis and writing the business logic as well right now if i have to do the same thing for uh, you know design schema and do all all those uh, things for our case as well so let's do that here so for the uh, let's start with the api right uh, what are the apis that needs to be there there will have to be a post api which 
would something be like shorten and in the body i can get the url and expiry right this would be the body this is one api the second api is basically a get api get is nothing but slash whatever is the short url and then you there is no body in get and you give long url as the response so these are the two main apis that needs to be there uh i won't spend much time into how we design that if that's a separate topic in itself uh, how do you design rest apis how do you, what makes a uh, url restful what does not make a url uh, restful all those things we'll consider later uh, like that's a topic of discussion uh, for a different uh, session i won't go into that then you have to design the schema for this particular problem the schema for this particular problem uh, is a simplistic one table schema you can have something like a short url you can have a long url and you can have validity which user generated this and maybe created at and maybe some other three four other tables uh, but the main columns are short url and the long url and the validity right these three columns are the main columns using these three columns i can answer both the apis that i have uh, listed out right now i have done uh, just a, qu a quick checklist i have made the db schema i have made the apis the only thing re remaining is using the what should be the business logic now if you think about the business logic uh, this problem can be solved in variety of ways right uh, one of the way to solve this particular problem is to uh, have one id field here right this id can be an integer and whenever you store something in, inside a database that id will get automatically generated incremented to be precise so it started with 1 2 3 4 5 whatever is the number that is the shortened url and that will not go beyond you know we are generating only 100k users per day and some 3 uh, 36 gb of data per day which means that your shortened url will not go beyond a certain uh, limit right it will not go beyond six digits or seven digits or maybe eight digits right whatever big url you are getting you just return the id and that will be the shortened url but that is not a good approach right uh, i hope everyone can realize that uh, it will not be a good approach if you just rely on the database auto generated id why that won't be a good approach because that's easily guessable so if i have for example i used your api and i uh, used your api to generate a small url and then what i did was i just uh, you returned me 54 that is telling me that hey there are you know 53 other entries already present in the database as well so i can just query using 52 53 and find out who, what all who all are using your services so it's easily guessable so that that's not that's out of picture the second approach so first approach was basically relying on auto generated id right the second approach uh, which i think rahul uh, has also uh, pointed out is around using the uuid or maybe using the hash function uh, like md5 or sha256 and things like that by default we cannot use uuid why it's a 32 byte 32 bit character essentially we don't require uh, anything like this why because it is generating 32 bits of characters i don't need 32 bits md5 also is 32 bits sha256 is 256 bits i don't require these many characters why so let's look at how many numbers i can generate with one single character or how many urls can i store with one single character with one single character i have 26 choices of alphabets plus 10 digits 0 to 9 10 digits so around 36 choices i have only with alphanumeric characters if i use it for sh shortened url if i also include the casing i'll also introduce another 26 characters which makes the total tally to 62 so with a single character i can represent 62 big urls so let's suppose my big url was this i transformed it and i said that hey uh, i will represent this big url with a and i'll store this particular mapping to uh, in the database right now 
how many uh, urls can i store using two characters then the first 62 the first uh, character can represent 62 the other character can also represent 62 right so it will be 62 into 62 which is equal to 62 raised to the power 2 how many for uh, with 3 62 raised to the power 3 and so on how many with n characters 62 raised to the power n so even if i have 5 right 62 raised to the power 5 is uh, i think somewhere in millions or billions which will do my job in case i need more i can add one more 62 raised to the power 6 probably and i will get my response i will get my final so shivan says uh, shivan dube says it will be 62 into 61 uh, no i can use a and capital a again so for the other character also i have the same exact same repetitions can be there anyways in either of the cases uh, 61 or 62 that really doesn't matter what i was hinting or what i was approaching uh, from this particular discussion was that there'll be uh, exponential number of uh, combinations that i can create with a limited set of characters so i have solved one part of the problem uh, right the part of problem that which all characters or what should be my business strategy to come up with uh, to represent million or a billion long urls that i have really solved i have solved for that what i have not solved for is the guessability factor meaning that if i have a a if i return someone a a or maybe a a b right? let's suppose i return a b this really tells me that there has to be a url generated with a a so what can i do to remove this guessability factor any thoughts on that how do i remove the guessability so what i can do is i can generate multiple messages with or i can pre compute all the uh, numbers right i can pre compute everything and then i pick up few uh, pick up the first million and then push it into a set a hash set a hash set will just randomize it and then then i can just uh, iterate on the key set once i have uh, accessed a particular code i can save it in the database that will basically ensure that my you know that that will basically ensure that a uh, guessability factor is removed and it is scalable as well so that was my point number 4 how do you design system that can work in a single machine right design for a single system or for a single server now to add scalability factor we need to what what will can be the bottleneck that one server is not enough to cater to my high uh, high read tps in that case what can i do i can have multiple servers who are running this piece of logic and each server is responsible for uh, each server is basically responsible for generating its own version of code right so i can say uh, let's suppose i have running 26 servers or let's suppose i'm running only three servers server 1 server 2 and server 3 i give 1 million pre generated coupons for this one 1 million to this and 1 million to this right so as in when i am adding new servers i am giving this 1 uh, million set of uh, you know pre generated uh, codes that can be used by that particular server i while assigning this 1 million coupon codes i can ensure that there is no collision once these uh, codes are residing in the memory of the server i am not introducing any new latency and i am ensuring that the date, uh, you know i have designed a low latency system that can scale to million of users millions of users as well right so that was the basic idea right uh, you go for first four uh, steps you gather the requirements you estimate the scale you find out what are the design choices or the design trade offs that you need to make once you have identified that the next step is to uh, basically design your system that can work on a single system that will involve writing your writing some db uh, schema that will also involve writing apis and also finding what is the core business logic that we should support right once that is done then is scale for the numbers that you have identified in this step estimate scale set how do you basically scale for whatever you have decided once you have discussed all the approaches and all the problems then you go back to the gather requirements the, the mvp stage uh, in the mvp building stage you have written some requirements 
just go through one uh, each requirements one by one and validate that whatever you've written is working fine and you know all the features that you've discussed earlier are taken care of right so this was the basic idea now let's jump into the question and i will stop the screen share yeah so he was asking that while i was estimating the scale won't i consider the read once uh, as well because there were number of uh, the the number of users who are doing the read and the number of users who are doing the write operations are different hence uh, i think the question came that read once should also be stored uh, i think uh, that that is not required because whenever you have to write something to a database only that that amounts for the storage read once you'll consider while calculating the tps or throughput on your system then you can uh, you'll basically have to consider the read uh, request as well his uh, another question was that expiry of url uh, would it be 24 hours one week uh, availability must so uh, that's a valid question which you should definitely ask when you are uh, appearing for interviews uh, i didn't clarify while i was designing it but uh, i had taken the expiry from the client itself whoever is generating the url can tell me typically tell me that when is it that he wants this particular url to expire by default i can have some you know keep the link open for maybe years uh, but you should have a fixed expiry to all the you know uh, whatever you are adding in the database and this is a very key concept if you think closely about it expiry can save you from adding or having to uh, add multiple you know shards as well why because if you don't have expiry your data will keep on growing right it will go on a linear scale or exponential scale depending upon how people are interacting with your service but if you truncate older data that means your same single database instance can serve the request as well so that is actually very important that you clarify you in your with your interview that what is his expectation out of the expiry most likely if he ask you to design a uh, you know url shorter ex even expiry will not be a uh, uh, explicit ask right uh, this is something that you should you as an interviewee should have you know uh, clarity on you should ask that particular question right cool batch versus stream when to use right uh, that's a very interesting question uh, i think it actually depends on your use case right uh, for example in some cases batch processing does make sense for uh, i'll give you one example uh, right for example Crickbuzz. Uh, let, let's suppose uh, we have a website like Crickbuzz. Now, Crickbuzz have started, let's say, one game wherein people can play uh, or people can chat live during or comment on a, any anything while the match is going on. After the match is over, over, they'll find whatever or whoever has the maximum number of like on a particular comment. They'll reward that particular user. Now, in this case, either you can you. still you have both options either you can stream all the comments that are coming and then uh, have a aggregate on number of likes each comment is getting or since it's a one off activity after uh, which is supposed to happen af just after the match you can also uh, use a batching system here i would use a batching system here solely because it's a activity which will happen only after the match right if you see irct see website uh, that goes down after 11:30 pm every uh, every day that is because they want to reconcile everything it's a batch process the salaries for example are a batch process where i would need a stream i think a stream processing engine would make sense for example if i want to do some cloud deployment and i want to check whether in real time are there any security anomalies in my cloud deployment right uh, or for example any kind of an audit that i want to maintain right for example if if somebody on launches a ec2 instance and he has uh, you know attached a public ip to that particular instance that is a opening into my vpc cloud which is a security threat and ideally i would want to catch it in real time so over there i would go for the stream stream processing engine because i want to have a live action defined for every outcome that is happening okay i think that's a very good question uh, his question was when i was defining the schema right uh, when i was defining the schema for uh, my url short now i didn't add id uh, id i added later only when i was you know going to the business aspect of it but uh, a quick 
yes or no in your mind just uh, keep a yes or no in your mind do you think a primary key is required in this case let's talk about yes and its implication of having a uh, external id if i have an id internally all the mysql or rdbms system what they do is they sort the data physically uh, based on id so id 1 will be placed closer to 2 will be placed closer to next to 3 will be placed next to 4 and so on so this helps in uh, you know fast retrieval of data because they are able to look up for that particular key in a very fast manner now my primary lookups you know i, I have seen this many or uh, you know many people uh, doing this that they uh, just add id for the heck of it there is no real use case of it right uh, for me my id is the most of the time my requests are going to be short url what given a short url what is the end uh, long url that will be that is going to be the reads to optimize for that i'll keep the short id as my primary key it is unique right and i want the data to be fetched using that hence having a an explicit auto incremental or any kind of other id is not required just having a short url uh, will serve my purpose so if you want to go deeper into it uh, just read about locality of reference it's a very important concept primarily used in dbms system so you can typically go ahead and look into that uuid hash space and all those systems does not work solely because they are they generate 32 bit uh, numbers and let's suppose i skim the last 5 or last 6 also then also there will be many much, many chances of collisions so dealing into those uh, areas will just be problematic pseudo random number generators so for anything that you're doing with randomness right either the range has to be a lot meaning uh, for example for 30 Two bit number MD five that that is basically a good enough hack to generate a thirty two bit unique number, or I can go with UID and generate a random number. But if my range is limited, now let's uh, just to give you an example. Let's say I have only two numbers zero and one, and I ask you to generate a random number between zero and one. You generated zero. Let let's suppose uh, the first number that you generated was zero. I again ask you to uh, generate a pseudo random number let's suppose again you generated zero and again i ask you and again zero is generated right now you just have one number remaining and there are chances of uh, there are many chances of you know collisions there are 50% chance of uh, that the, you generate the number which was already generated before now let's uh, increase the range of your numbers now you have 0 1 2 3 4 numbers right let's suppose uh, 0 1 2 uh these three numbers are already generated the probability of generating a new uh, random number which is not been used earlier is just 0.25 75% chances are there that he'll generate the number which is already generated so as you keep on exhausting the available resources the operation which was already o1 operation is basically tending to on right you can take n chances to generate that particular number if you have 100 numbers the probability of one number getting picked up is 1 by n so if you have uh, out of the first 100 numbers you filled up 99 the probability of you know generating or uh, the number which is not used randomly is very very less right so it's 1 by 100 so you have to take 100 tries then find out that particular number in a best case in in a probabilistic kind of a case scenario so that's not a very good you know uh, way to find it out uh, randomly randomness helps you in some cases but randomness is not a uh, good enough criteria so you can uh, search for uh, this particular problem it's a uh, very famous problem asked in interviews as well asked in coding interviews as well that if you have one array one and you have want to pick up random in- indexes in a equal probability so let's suppose uh, you have numbers from 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 out of these six numbers you want to give equal probability to each number and find out and generate a random number out in this how would you do that right uh, the standard way of doing that is uh, you always generate a number from since you had six uh, places you generate a uh, random number from 0 to 5 whatever is the index let's say 3 is picked you swap 3 with the last element 
and you decrement the range earlier you the range of you know uh, finding out the random number was 0 to 5 for the next iteration it will be 0 to 4 for the next iteration it will be 0 to 3 and so on and you keep on swapping the index um, of element which is getting picked with the last value how is uh, how is the server assigned a set of million records out of all the possible records uh, i think i have discussed this uh, problem very briefly you can generate all the sequences first million sequences then second million uh, sequences and third million sequences whatever is the sequence that you've generated put it in the hash set hash set will automatically rearrange the keys right it is not uh, a list typically keeps everything in order uh, if you put it in a hash uh, set kind of a data structure it will automatically you know jumble up the uh, records that you are getting and and that will basically ensure that you are getting a random id every time batch processing uh, would be amazon order salary stock market yes stream processing live sentiment analysis sentiment analysis also can be done uh, using batch processing might not be a uh, yeah it, it actually makes sense if you want to you know triage or maybe alert or mark as misinformation on the you know twitter or uh, facebook these days so yes you can use sentiment analysis which can be a skill let's take this question uh, he says if we are pre assigning the short keys won't it be time taking for searching available key to assign as if we were to try to create a uh, on a particular second no uh, so let me explain this process let's suppose these are my available slots let's suppose these are my available slots now what i need to do is whenever a request comes i need to pick one number out of it randomly right uh, and assign it to the incoming request this is stored in memory in memory meaning this is stored on the same server on which my application server are run right so let's suppose the first request comes and i generate the random number the random number which was generated between 0 to 6 i generate a random number between 0 to 6 and that returns me 2 so what i do is i move i return 2 2 is now assigned to the big url and i move 2 here right so 2 comes here so 2 comes here and 6 comes here all right so the new array now becomes this next one number again comes so what i'll do is now i'll decrease the size size is till this so i'll generate a random number between 0 to 5 let's suppose the number that came was 1 what i'll do i'll move this 1 to this i'll swap the two numbers what will be the resultant array the resultant array would be 5 will come here 1 will go here and size minus minus if i have to generate new next random number what i'll do i'll take random of 0 to 5 let's suppose 1 is generated now 5 and 4 will be exchanged right so the data will become 4 here 5 here size minus minus and so on i can just continue this so using this way i can you know find out generating a random number between two numbers is very easy right uh, it's an o n kind of an operation so using this particular approach i can find out keys and i can ensure that the guessability factor is you know is, is maintained to a certain extent and how do i distribute if i have multiple let's suppose i just have 10 10 buckets each so how do i distribute 10 10 buckets means that one server let's suppose can handle only 10 keys how do i distribute them i have a list of 200 you know urls that can be generated i pick the first 10 and i send it back i save this 10 in the first server that is how i can ensure ensure that uh, each server has uh, 10 keys to work with all right guys uh, thank you so much uh, guys for joining in bye bye all right we are live uh, hello everyone uh, i am mohit yadav and today we uh, have with us lokesh who will be interviewing uh, mock interviewing with us uh the topic for today would be a topic around system design and i let you introduce yourself uh and tell me something about yourself lokesh hey hi everyone uh, uh my name is lokesh uh, i'm currently working as a senior software engineer at akamai 
So I'm I'm totally having uh, six years of experience. Um, so prior to Akamai, I worked at Big Basket. Uh, so currently uh, at Akamai, I'm working as full stack developer. Um, so I, I'm graduated from uh, AAAT Nozweed in 2015. Um, yeah, so that's uh, it about me. So sure, uh, cool. So I'll just quickly tell the format for our viewers as well. Uh, I'll be asking questions. Uh, Lokesh will be answering me and wherever i feel that i can you know add some value uh, valuable feedback i'll probably give that feedback to uh, you lokesh and uh, to the wider audience as well right uh, so sure. uh, instead of giving the feedback and keeping the feedback for the last i'll probably keep on giving the feedback as and when we go around right uh, cool so uh, i think there are a few users who have joined us uh, let's wait for a couple of more minutes uh, before we get started uh, meanwhile, I'll also uh, share the screen. So uh, whenever you talk about, uh, you know, uh, if there's a need to draw something on a whiteboard, I'll use my iPad to draw that particular uh, thing for you. For example, sure. if you say a load balancer, I'll draw a load balancer for you. If you say something, uh, sure. other things, uh, maybe application servers or databases, I'll draw those databases uh, as well for you. Right? Uh, sure. Cool. So let's get started. Uh, the question. For today is you need to design a Google search type ahead. Uh, how would you go about designing that? Okay, so um, so basically, um, so if I uh, look at the requirement, so basically, uh, when users uh, type something on UI, uh, so he needs to get um, the list of suggestions. Um, so in, in in the in the drop down, uh, so that's the basic requirement. And uh, coming to the suggestions. Uh, so that's uh, the first thing is the suggestions sh should be uh, sorted by the popularity in the decreasing order. So the most popular should be at the top, uh, or the most you know search are most popular. Um, so um, and also uh, also um, sometimes I mean we also need to take care of uh, uh, you know the uh, muted words. So I mean we we don't want to show some pi pirated or. Um, some adult, so some kind of words we don't want to show, so we need to filter them. So uh, that's also one requirement. So we need to filter, uh, filter it, filter them. Okay. Um, so I'm just thinking. Um, so popularity and uh, so um, so I think um, so um, so so uh, for I mean for this um, so I'm assuming we need to display top ten uh, 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 popular words. Uh, I mean popular um, uh, phrases only. Uh, so uh, let's just say top uh, five would do. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Top, top five. five. Yeah. Top five uh, words. Right. Um, and. So yeah, and also uh, the mo mo the most important thing is you know it should handle the typos. So uh, if we uh, make any typos, the user make any typos, so it should handle that. So that is one word. I mean one requirement. Yeah. So um I'm so I'm assuming this is the scope of um this uh, system system. I mean as as per the functional requirements. Um. So and um. Anything so, else? Uh, 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 that you see in a typical Google search. Mm. For example, if you search for weather and I search for weather, we'll be shown different results. Okay, you mean the informational uh, results? So sh should we also right. consider? Uh, is it like Correct. so? Okay, so uh, that means like you know, Prime Minister of India. So in the in the drop down, we'll get the uh, answer for that. So you mean uh, uh, those not the answer? Uh, for example, uh, if I type Prime. I watch prime time news a lot. So for me, the suggestion can be prime time. Uh, let's suppose you search prime minister a lot. Okay. Uh, so for you, prime minister will come. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Got it. So 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 using the cookies. Um. So user cookies or so personalization. So user okay. pers uh, personalization. Um. Uh, recommendation. Yeah. So right. personalization. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. That I missed. Yeah. That's one of the thing. And um. So the um so uh, so also we should should so should we uh, consider the location based search or uh, not yeah we so can, we can uh, so uh, this is basically the first phase right uh, where we just scope yeah. out that uh, just by looking at google search type uh, type head these are the five things or 10 things that are coming to my mind 
now yeah. uh, to in uh, in order to discuss it in a uh, you know 45 minute interview uh, it is not possible to go and design each and every uh, yeah. feature so we'll just True. limit the number of features that we are uh, you know uh, we are going to discuss so i'll True. cross out popular we definitely need to sort the result based on popularity that's a must have uh, yeah. we don't have to filter words uh, we can assume that uh, you know filtration is not required so okay. yeah this is something that we can remove uh, okay. top 5 uh, again top 5 is a primary requirement for google search so we need to have that typo handling also we can ignore personalization and location based uh, you know uh, suggestions uh, are also something that we can ignore for now like, okay. uh, we may discuss it if we have time towards the end exactly. the personalization yeah. Bit, right yeah. so let's start with these two popularity and top five. Yeah. So, um, so, so, th so these are the functional requirements and coming to non-functional requirements. So basically, um, so, you know, um, so the system that I want, um, so, uh, so, so the, first of all, I mean, if I go back cap, so, um, so, so the system should anyway have to, um, have to handle the partition tolerance because of the network failures or any failure. So the partition should be always there. Um, so, okay. and then if I want to choose, uh, that means, I mean, basically, you know, the scalable. So I'm, I'm actually choosing scalability, um, uh, to be my uh, first priority and also, uh, so over availability and consistency. Um, so for, for, for this case, I actually uh, go over, go with, um, uh, availability. Uh, the reason being, you know, the reason being why I do not go with consistency is because, um, so I mean, like if, if, uh, eventual consistency. Uh, is is okay so you know uh, instead of strong consistency uh eventual consistency is okay for this um uh, system i'm i'm uh, thinking why because um i mean sometimes sometimes um i mean even though even though if we are not so let's say uh, we have um some top five uh results but uh let's say we are we are uh we are sto i mean we are showing um let's say let's say you know the incorrect one like in the let's say uh, there is a there is a term which is top five but we are showing top uh, six or you know i mean what i mean which is misplaced so that is fine like you know it can eventually uh, propagate and you know we can show so that's why i'm uh, actually going with availability and the scalability um okay. so and uh, coming to scale estimations uh so um so i'm i'm, I'm actually so uh, first of all uh, the number of requests um so uh, basically um since since it's the scale of uh, google um, so I'm, I'm thinking maybe some 5 billion requests uh, per day uh, at the scale of Google, I'm uh, thinking. Uh, so how did you come up with this particular number? Um, I mean, so um, so basically, I mean, um, I mean, I just came with random because uh, so obviously um, the request will be, will be billions, um, uh, I mean, taking uh, Google search. So... Uh, that's why um, I came with like, you know, some five or 10 billion. So f 5 billion I came up with. Uh, okay. Uh, a good way for uh, scale estimation, right? Uh, this is, uh, okay. uh, I'm basically giving a feedback. A good way to uh, do scale estimation is to look at the daily active users and yeah, then exactly. reduce, uh, and then reduce what, uh, what are your uh, TPS and storage requirements would be. Right. Uh, yeah. So Google has, uh, I think close to two or three billion let's uh, for the sake of calculation let's assume that google have one billion users and every user may be uh, queries at least once a day uses yeah. google search at least once a day so there will be one billion queries uh, per day these are the reads and every read exactly. is contributing to the right as well. So I'll leave exactly. the thought here and let you continue the thought. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, so uh, so this system uh, is um, actually uh, read and read. I mean, so read and writes are um, equal uh, here. Um, so that means one is to one, and um, so that means so uh, here it is uh, one. So we we are um, so thinking. I mean, we are having that uh, one billion uh, request per day. Uh, I mean, because we are having one uh, billion users. Um, so and then and then uh, coming to um, so and then coming to the storage. Um, so I think we can we can leave this here. And then coming to storage. Um, so uh, in our system, so we only need to store uh, the queries. I mean the 
uh, the votes or the uh, the queries. Um, so for that, I'm thinking so uh, maybe so uh, each query, uh, so each query at max may not store, uh, uh, may not uh, take more than. Um, so maybe like you know, um, so uh, so so since since they're strings, um, so and they actually I'm thinking. Uh, maybe like you know less than a, a kilobyte um so that means like something like um some some five some five twelve bytes or something i'm i'm thinking like you know half half a kilobyte uh so each um so each word um so that means uh, that means we are having one billion requests so one billion into uh half i mean uh into 0 0.5 kb so which will i think uh, i need to calculate so so something something uh, in terabytes but is that calculation yeah. correct uh, because although we are getting one billion search queries, uh, do you want to relook at this number? Uh, we, uh, because all of them are not unique. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, all of them are, are not unique, and um, so and in in our system we don't write them. I mean, so we don't write all of them. So we already may have uh, other info. So that's why you know I I, I actually uh, so I mean the maximum threshold. So let's say um, we got a word or we got a phrase in the worst case uh, that is not in that not in the uh, in the in the system. So uh, in that case we 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 have to store the whole word. So uh, so that's why I came up with you know uh, less than a kilobyte. So around maybe some two fifty six bytes or something. Uh, okay. I mean zero point yeah so two fifty six bytes. Um, so at, at maximum I'm uh, thinking. Okay, uh, so we'll leave the storage part here. Let's move ahead. Uh, let's just assume that uh, one box is not enough to handle the entire storage data. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, let's just assume that uh, there were some issues with the storage. The issues were that uh, you were reducing the size of the particular uh, record. Instead, then I'm what I'm arguing on is that the, you won't be having one billion records to write. Because exactly. let's say I search for Michael uh, and you also search for Michael, that will end up going in the same direction. I'll just update the frequency. But let's exactly. uh, see the design first and then we'll come back to the storage part later. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so uh, I'll go with the first, go with, you know, um, so the basic design. Um, so basically when we, you know, um, so we can actually think of, you know, um, the, the, the first thing that comes to, you know, uh, to our mind is, you know, try. So, I mean, to store them in a try. So you know it's very um so it's very trivial uh, and obvious that you know the, I mean by by looking at the question so that means we have to use try so um so basically you know we'll have one node and you know uh, for each node we'll have uh, we'll we'll store them um yeah uh, so um so uh, so so let uh, so let me first you know try I mean let me first go on go by um uh, the, I mean the flow. So basically, the user sends a HTTP request. Um, so with the votes um, in it. Um, so let's say user user searches with um, uh, uh, Donald. Okay. Um, so as you, as you written. So uh, basically, uh, I mean initially, I'm, I'm assuming that you know I have only you know um, I mean I don't have large scale, but you know small system. So basically, um, so the client sends the request, and I uh, so uh, I actually go and look up the try. Um, so, and, and each lookup, I actually try to find, uh, um, so, uh, I mean, if, 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 if it's a successful match, uh, that means if it's a successful vote, um, so then, uh, I actually update the frequency at that, at the terminal node. So basically we know that in a, in a try, uh, we actually store a, a Boolean called E is vote to, uh, to tell whether that's a, uh, vote or not. So basically, uh, yeah. So that's a word. So uh, whenever it uh, ends there, so we so in, in our case we also we also store the frequency. Um, so you know which will be updated uh, incrementally uh, every time. Uh, so and um, so, so 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 one uh, quick question yeah. over here. Uh, so you said that uh, let's suppose the search query is down here, right? Uh, and uh, there is a null character over here as well. That means Don is also a valid word. So you yeah. suggested, let's say two words, Don and Donald, and he clicked on Donald. So what all, where all? Uh, now, I think each node can have its own frequency. So each uh, terminal each, node 
each uh, node means yeah. uh, each terminal each node terminal. can have its yeah. own, uh, own frequency. Yes. So which all frequency would you modify? Yeah. So, uh, so you're saying uh, when uh, user enters Devo and Don, so we'll suggest Don and Donald. Um, so if user clicks on Donald, so which we will uh, increment, right? Correct. Yeah. So uh, in this case, since user selected Donald, so that means we we will will increment the frequency of Donald. So that means the D terminal node because I mean right. that's where that is getting hit. So uh, this frequency we will hit. Uh, I mean, uh, however, there are still problems with this, but we'll um, eventually find it find it out. Um, so so this, this is the basic approach. Uh, so, so um, what are so the problems with it uh, in terms of? Yeah. So what I want is top exactly. five. How would I uh, like? What can? What is the complexity of your current solution basically? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so here the problem would be so when I want top five, um, so I, I actually have to traverse uh, the whole tree. Correct. Um, so, so that means so let's say when when I said like um, D O N, so that means from N, um, so I need to actually traverse through. Um, I mean, wh whatever the depth of that um, a tree. Uh, I mean located at n um so i need to uh, i need to look look them uh, and then and then i need to uh, find the maximum maximum of them and then again i need to return them so um so, right. so uh, here the problem would be drilling down the uh, uh, tree so um so 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 i mean we need to f uh, find you know how can we uh, resolve it Right. So uh, first of all, first question is how would you find top five uh, out of? Let's suppose you are doing the iteration also. Yeah. How would you actually find the top five elements? Okay. So you mean ham? Um, so we can do iteration. This is as good yeah, as uh, um, I have an array and I yeah. need to find top five. So exactly. So so the main thing and also um, so uh, basically when I when I um, so came across this top. Uh, or you know, I mean, uh, Kate, I mean, Kate, the largest of this. So, I actually think of uh, building heap, but but again, um, so I'm thinking, uh, so I mean, so can we store this uh, information in the in 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 each node? Like, so uh, as we as we build the uh, try, uh, can we actually uh, can we actually store, um, so let's say at the end, can we actually store the information that okay, so top five. Um, uh, top five words at the end are these. Uh, can we actually okay. store them? Uh, I mean, so, how, so uh, uh, yeah. which data structure would you use to store them? So uh, here, uh, I'm I'm thinking, you know, it would be uh, so it would be uh, enough if we can uh, store the I mean store the references of the terminal node. So let's say, um, so n at the end, so d is another terminal node uh, having some good frequency. Okay. So here we can. Uh, See here, here we can use a heap, uh, uh, a max heap. Okay. Um, so a max heap. A max um, heap. So we can, okay. Um, so the top. Uh, are will, you sure that you'll use a max heap for finding top five? So be, because here, here we need, we need, uh, we need top by the decreasing. I mean, by the decreasing order of the popularity, right? So. Uh, okay. That means every time I actually remove the maximum at the. Uh... Mm -hmm. I lost your voice, uh, actually. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, now it's now, now you're audible. Yeah, uh, am I am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Uh, you are audible. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hello, hello, hello. I can hear you fine. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, it's a recorded session. How can you say it's live? Uh, it's not a recorded uh, session, Sahu. Uh, it's um, it's actually live. Uh, I can hear you, man. Uh, uh, Lokesh, hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, 
facing technical challenges guys uh, just bear with us for some time uh, can you try reconnecting lokesh I, I i'm able to hear you fine meanwhile i'll just take questions that are there uh, so locations based personalized search yes fast response time yes hey lokesh uh, are you uh, am i audible now yes yes yeah i think some yes. glitch i mean ha huh, yeah fine no issues uh, we are back uh, so we were discussing about that uh, we uh, you said we'll have a max heap over here yeah right uh, so yeah. do you see a problem in that i'll give you some numbers uh, let's say these are the numbers 4 5 3 0 6 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51 52 53 54 55 56 57 58 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 66 67 68 69 70 71 72 73 and let's suppose you want to find top 3 elements so you yeah. try building a heap so you added 4 in the heap then you yeah. add 5 so you 5 is added then you add 3 3 is added now comes the value of 0 should zero be added or not how do you decide that okay basically you'll have to check so, all the elements in the heap to do that right oh, wait wait when so um okay you saying um so we want top 3 right so okay um so yeah in this case uh, we will check uh yeah so basically we need to check the minimum element to find uh, but the minimum is at, is not at the yeah maximum is at there yeah. okay okay yeah. yeah 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 that's true so if we find 3 uh, yeah that's true that's so true. Uh, hmm. so uh, when it came 6 uh, so we'll check uh, with 3 uh, if it is greater then yeah 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 so uh, instead of this uh, what we could have is uh, a minimum heap Yeah. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. basically, uh, so four will be there, five will be there, then three will come. So three comes here, and four comes here. Then yeah, zero, zero is not greater than three. Six is greater, so we'll remove uh, three and we'll add six. So that that's how it will be. That yeah. cool. So uh, every node uh, will have a min heap attached to it. Uh, the size of the min heap will be five. Uh, yeah. Till that, we have solved the problem. So using that, we can. uh typically answer our query in an order one time yeah right yeah exactly so, mm. cool so uh that uh, till that we are clear uh, what about uh what can we do after that yeah so uh, this is the basic design uh so um so i mean like i'm i'm thinking about you know what else uh, i mean what other problems do we have with it so uh, i mean when we when we scale this up so the main problem would be the storage so like how do we store try um you know how do we handle uh, such a huge uh, use scale so um so basically um uh, so one thing uh, so w- so one thing we can do is we can actually uh replicate the try i mean we can actually use uh, like master slave ap- approach uh, by mm-hmm. having you know multiple copies of tries um so and uh, so and then we can you know uh, we can uh, propagate like just like how in databases so we can uh, write to master and then uh, uh, schedule uh, to slaves um so that uh, approach we can do um so be, so uh, uh, i'm thinking the problem would be uh, so the latency would be more in this case like uh mm-hmm. so i mean writing to so, so so there can be replication lag so we can add to the uh, latency of the user uh, so i mean the um, so the consistency can be little compromised so um, so this but this is one approach um, so and and also uh, one more thing is so this is okay like you know um, so this is uh, okay when we when we can store uh, the try in a one machine but um so but what about you know if 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 we have to partition that so that also we need to consider um yeah. so what if so, uh, if uh, it exists let's break it down what are the problems with this particular approach let's write down all the problems and then we'll discuss yeah. one by one what is the uh, what can be the yeah. probable solution so what are the problems can you identify the problems and tell me what what those are yeah the first problem is um uh, uh so i would say uh, the data partition partitioning uh 
okay so uh, I, i'd say storage yeah right uh, what else that one yeah, day, that entire data the entire tray that we are building cannot fit into one machine because we are uh, storing the uh, search like we are storing the tree tray of all the searches right so that is one problem what is the other problem yeah so that is one problem and um, so, so should i also consider on the client side like what issues we will have on client or not uh, not the client side we are designing the backend so let's focus our discussion oh, only on, on the backend okay so and also caching so i mean should we have have to cache uh, some queries or something i mean should we implement okay. caching here uh, so what kind of caching uh, are we the doing here this is uh, a try right so try would be stored in memory so we don't require a cache um so i mean like so uh, i mean if there are some popular uh, things um so we can actually we can actually you know return uh, i mean we can actually store some uh, entries in cache and you know we can uh, write the, i mean write it to try asynchronously i mean to increase uh, latency because uh, i mean the main requirement of the system is to have less i mean low latency uh, to the user Mm -hmm. uh, because you know if you i mean as the users are typing it should it should come in milliseconds so uh, i mean what if we if we store them store the uh, i mean like popular ones on cache and then we update them in the asynchronously uh, to the try uh, so uh, if you say how, how would you identify the popular ones in that case uh, is uh ba basically what you are saying is that maybe for some queries you'll uh, save data somewhere so that uh, those are basic anyways the top 10 or top 100 or top 200 or maybe top 1000 queries uh, you'll store it separately and whenever the term comes you'll search, you'll uh, give the response from there uh, but let's yeah. focus on the main problem the main problem is that we need to give a consistent okay. response for every uh system right we don't have to optimizing for some queries we can do it later but let's optimize okay. for the larger set of problems so apart okay. from storage okay. do you see any other issue uh in this particular approach yeah i'm thinking so um storage and uh, so we um uh, so i mean so main thing we need to improve is latency so that's the you know main uh, important thing um so in this system so Uh, for improving latency, uh, I'm just thinking. So, what else we can? Do? So, we identified. Uh, do you think updating these top five when we are updating yeah. the frequency of a Donald? Yeah, yeah that's the, true. Yeah, we need to update mm -hmm. D L all the nodes, right? Exactly. I'm I'm coming there. So, um, so when when we are updating the. uh updating one terminal load so right. we need to traverse back uh you know i mean so many levels uh to find you know each terminal load terminal load and so on to till root maybe mm -hmm. to our i mean some of us and we need to update this top so you know these up uh, these uh updations are uh yeah i mean are uh, so here th 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 that's that's one problem so uh, you said uh, we need to update terminal nodes uh, i think uh, we need to update every node uh, that's there in the path or uh, till the top node why because even if a person has typed do there should be a uh, heap yeah corresponding yeah, to yeah, o which can give you uh, the uh, node reference right <laughs> that that's true that's true yeah so that is end up updating l a n o and right up to d so for yeah. one read i am actually doing multiple uh, write operations hmm yeah that's true and i mean so these while i am yeah. updating this do you think a uh, read yeah. can succeed so 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 you mean like so we will not uh, so so we will not update them in in sync way but we'll do it in async way so we'll we'll just we'll just return the result and we'll um so use uh, asynchronous a way to update those nodes uh, but but that still be a problem uh, 
uh, because you know updating those uh, i mean so considering the scale uh, the number of requests um, so the updations will be a lot Mm -hmm. So, uh, basic thing, right? Uh, let's suppose I have one database where uh, this is a chunk of database. I have a value of x equal to, let's say, 5. Yeah. Right? Uh, people can come and read the value of x equal to 5. There can be multiple yes. read threads that can come and read this particular value. Now, let's exactly. suppose there is one thread which is trying to update this value. It wants to set the value of x equal to 10. Yeah. Unless this value is written, all the read threads will have to wait. They cannot read this value yeah, of that's x. True. That's true. So if I have to yeah. update the value of all the nodes, till the time I will not be able to serve the read uh, uh, reads as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, I mean, so in that case, yeah, Reese had has to wait till these are harm. That is true. Um, yeah, so. So my problem is how to uh, make this a read intensive. Read? It's a read equal yeah. to W kind of a system. I want reads to yeah. be greater than greater than W. Much, much greater than W. What is a way to do that? Okay, so to optimize reads, how can we? Uh, okay, so question is like to optimize reads. So I mean, how can we optimize reads? So I mean, yes. when we have more reads, um, yes. can I mold my system in such a way? Can I have some kind of a design trade-off <laughs> added here, which will make my system more read-friendly, and uh, I will lose writes only uh, after. Uh, like I, I need my rights to be very less as compared to the reads. So, um, so, so how can I mean? What if we have I mean instead of um, storing a big try? So, on what if we have uh, I mean because when we are uh, writing in a big try, one made in one try. So, what if we uh, I mean if we uh, chunk it and you know store the chunks and you know based on the ranges if we. Uh, go to that particular try and only update that try so that you know we are uh, reducing the uh, blast radius right so we are we are just reducing it uh so, so uh, i'm um, hmm. not sure how that would impact the number of rights so right now what we are doing i'll give you a hint uh, right uh, right now what we are doing is whenever a person clicks on uh, chooses one suggestion we are updating that particular frequency over here exactly do you think that it makes sense to update the frequency every time a user clicks uh, on a suggestion uh, by the way guys uh, who are looking for what the question is the question is uh, we are designing a search type ahead yeah okay yeah so um so uh, i mean if we do not update so then the subsequent uh, uh reach uh, will not get the top so i mean so uh so when when we are reading so you're saying you know instead of updating uh, maybe we will update later uh, or in uh, i mean in some intervals we'll update uh mm -hmm. I mean, we will just uh, store them and then update uh, in regular intervals, maybe. Yes. Yes. Seeing? How? Yes. That you are going in the right direction. Where can we store it? How can we store that? Um, so, uh, basically, um, so whenever user clicks on that, so we are actually updating. Instead of that, we'll store them uh, in some message queues or something. So then, you know. Um, in, in some message uh, queues and then uh, we will we will actually uh, have consumers that consumes uh, maybe every hour uh, or some regular intervals to update them uh, so even that uh, if, when you're storing in a queue that also has a problem right uh, some consumer will read that message and then come to update this particular freak, uh, this particular try that we have right Instead of that, why not store it in a hash map? Can you use a hash map 
to store it somehow and then after some frequency or after some threshold you update the complete frequency yeah but but so you saying with message queues queues will will have some redundancy is it uh, no so for message queue let's suppose i store it in a message queue there is a donald message here there is a donald yeah. message here there is a donald message here so i'll end up whoever is consuming my message will end up updating the queue yeah. the same number of times you have pushed the message hmm. so my rights yeah, i'm not true. decreasing the rights yeah that is can we use that is true. make that is use true. of a hash map yeah. Yeah. and decrease the frequency of rights hmm. yeah so in this case we'll have a map that will uh, that will have the uh, you know uh, that will have the frequency of uh, Uh, each uh, word, uh, you know, yes. in that regular interval, and then yeah, we will update in one shot. So you know, one, uh, okay. uh, I mean, one shot we can update. Yeah, that's that, that is. So yeah, that is. Our criteria yeah. could be that we only update once my frequency reaches beyond thousand, and thousand for a billion. If I consider billion search yeah. queries, thousand yeah. is a very very small number, right? Yeah. So I can afford to have a error margin of thousand. I don't need to yeah. need not be a very accurate margin as well. Yeah. Right. So uh, just keep updating the frequency in hash map, and once you reach let's say thousand, you update for that particular keyword. So for Donald, you'll just iterate through the tie and update the frequencies. Yeah. Plus thousand exactly. to whatever the, uh, it was earlier. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Cool. So uh, my one problem is solved uh, about the write part. Uh, now my reads are more, so I can add more parallelization. I can uh, have. Uh, I'll basically have lesser number of writes. So that inherently gives me an opportunity to cache or do all sorts of optimization. Uh, yeah. But we still have this problem of storage. That entire try, I cannot push. at the entire try in a single box yeah yeah that is so true how do i so how do I yeah okay. yeah so um, like you know we, we we can actually partition it in such a way that maybe uh, i mean i'm just iterating some possibilities and we can actually look at the pros and cons so one is uh, so range based partition like you know all a's or all b's at once uh, but but this this will not uh, scale well why because um, uh let's say you know the words at with starting with x or w maybe less than the words starting with other alphabet so um so you know again so that will be a problem um so um so or we can actually take prefixes and uh, store by prefixes uh okay. so um um so maybe like you know um so a to uh like you know from like ab to uh, a d or something so those prefixes uh, if we store a to let's say k is something l to n is something and x to z something like this right maybe yeah. basically bucketing uh, you basically creating the buckets uh no i mean not like that but still you know uh, not not with uh, length of one but maybe three so let's say Um, so there can be words like you know um, so like uh, starting with uh, c a t cat um, so and again they, they, there can be many words um, some may, maybe let's say some millions of words and anyway, so like uh, taking the prefix and you know storing by those prefixes like um, so a b or a b c and so on um, so um, i think a b is stored in one and then a c is another one a d is another one and so on yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so let's yeah, suppose uh, with this, I'll have six. Uh, sorry, twenty-six into twenty-six characters. These many yeah, combinations yeah, sure. I'll have, uh, and it is not really necessary that I, I I might have more machines. I might have lesser machines. Yeah, that is right? also true. So yeah. how would you map huh. this number with the number of machines that I have? Let's say I have X machines. So. N uh, so how would you map this uh let's call this x x number or x number of prefixes with the n machines that i have so we can we can actually um so we can actually do by hashing so uh for a word we can you know have a hash function 
so um so that can actually i mean so when we when we store so basically we will not store all those ebs in in one machine but um, so basically what i'm saying so uh, let's say uh, we'll determine so um, so what starting with prefix ab uh, or ac ad and so on uh, some x uh, some k number of prefixes we'll store in one machine um, so and and uh, so, so I, mean, I mean like that we'll store in multiple machines mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the question over there is, uh, I think what you're hinting at is that there'll be uh, out of these, one machine will hold multiple prefixes as well. But yeah. how would you decide, uh, let's suppose I have prefix AA, on which machine this particular prefix, sh prefix should go? How would you determine yeah. that? So, so, um, so basically, so these machines, uh, so these machines will be behind a load balancer. So where my load balancer will have will maintain this mapping. So this with that mapping, uh, the load balancer can, uh, the load balancer can relate to that particular machine. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, there is a load balancer which is sending it to one of the machines that is available. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. But in the load balancer also. Uh, most of the load balancers are uh, primarily uh, stateless. stateless. So yeah. you need to have a stateful kind of a load balancer over here. So do you yeah. know how to do a load balancing in stateful system? I'm just looking for one specific term. Uh, Anand Kumar R, you are right. Uh, you use the right term. Uh, so basically the term that I was looking at is consistent hashing. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I was coming to that. So, I mean, as I said, yeah. hashing there. So I right. mean, I'm, so, I'll actually yeah. eventually come, but this uh, I got it, uh, got me, got in my mind. Like, yeah, so consistent hashing we can do. Right. So yeah. we will use consistent hashing. You still not answered. What would be the shard key? On what particular parameter? I think this is your shard key, right? Uh, A B and A A and E C. Uh, Though that is what is short key, but what will you call that? Again, looking for a specific term, you've answered that uh, in your uh, previously. Okay, so I mean, you, you're saying this these uh, prefixes. What do we call yes. uh, prefixes. them? Prefixes is what we, I was looking at. So prefix becomes my uh, short key. Yeah. Uh, and once I have these prefixes ready. I can just uh, push it to a consistent hashing ring and yeah. it will distribute the load evenly and it will uh, take care of how many number of servers are there, how many number of servers are not there. So we have yeah. correctly yeah. stored the uh, storage problem as well. Yeah. Any other problems that you see? Mm. So, um, so I, I mean, can you go up? So the the const, I mean, the uh, scope is only top and uh, I mean, I forgot yeah. the scope. So only top, top five and popularity. popularity. Okay. So popularity problem is um, solved, and uh, top is also solved. Right. So and you know, we'll do optimization. So. So I mean, like as of now, um, I don't think. Um, so much a uh, problems here so i mean because uh, the basic design is fine like we can apply optimizations on these so we have introduced sharding what if let's suppose uh, this particular application server is holding a a b a c a and some more data what if this server goes down <laughs> Yeah. Um, so how would you ensure that if this server also, if a server goes down, then also your system is done? So, um, so I need to copy, the, I mean, I need to have these keys in another system. So that's one, right. I mean, right. So um, how do we do that? One minute. So I forgot that. So, um, this is nothing but replication, right? 
yeah i mean so this is what so that means we will that means we will we'll keep the replicas in other machines also right yes. or each one i mean yes. each of the prefix uh, 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 each of the prefix can be replicated to multiple servers as well multiple servers yeah right? that's what so, yeah, um, and that is how we can define uh, how, uh, how how we are basically replicating so I'll quickly ask you a question on consistent hashing itself, right? Uh, so let's suppose these are my server IDs, one, two, and three. All right. Yeah. Uh, now let's suppose I have one object over here. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is key one. I'll use a different color. Uh, this is key one. Okay. Now this K one on which server will this data will be stored? For K1, either you go in the clockwise direction or you clockwise go or anti clock, yeah, or anti clockwise. So let's choose one convention. Uh, let's go in the clockwise direction and let's clockwise, store it yeah. in two. two. So two is holding my data, yeah. What is the next hour? If let's suppose I set the replication factor equal to uh, mm -hmm. two, that means two server needs to hold the data, yeah. What would be the next choice of server? Should I rep push this data to one? Should I push this data to four? Should I push this data to three? Two is the ideal candidate. I have added the data, but I need one more server to hold a co copy of this particular data. Which server out of the other three available is the best candidate for that? Okay. Okay. So um... your options are one, four, and three. Two is already holding the data. Okay, so now two is holding. Um, so, so, uh, so if we if we assign to three, um, so the problem would be. So if we assign to three, the problem would be since we are going in clockwise. Um, so if if two is also uh, went down, I mean, so, I mean for, for two, uh, we again uh, have to store them. I mean, store the replica of two in uh, some other machine, but. Um, so uh, I mean, storing in uh, in the clockwise uh, would be a problem here because um, I mean, if if two goes down, um, so we will uh, I mean we'll have three uh, for it. Uh, wait, I'm I'm not, I'm not able to. Uh... So you're going in the right direction. So where will this K one be routed if two goes down? So it will be routed to three. So um, so in the right. clockwise, it will be routed to three. Correct. Uh, so that means if we, if we store at three, um, so if three also goes down. Then it's a different so, problem. Yeah. So this we'll, is a different we'll problem. Solve one problem yeah. at a time. Yeah. Uh, right yeah, now, think... if two goes down, uh, there should be, uh, we don't need to three. transfer the data from two to some other node. My, other by uh, newer queries will be routed to three and three already has the data yeah right so yeah my natural choice becomes three in this case right exactly right cool uh so uh yeah i think uh that is uh we've discussed enough on this there is one more way to decrease the number of write operations mm -hmm. can anyone uh, you or anyone who's joined us uh, tell me one approach which we can use to make this property hold true right now uh, if i don't do anything writes and reads are same i want a system where my reads are much much greater than my number of writes one way that we have discussed is the hashing approach can you guys think of uh, one more way to do this. so as you as you said hash maps so similar to that maybe map reduce uh, kind of system thing we can use like we'll have a map and then you know those reduced jobs will write it down to them what are the what is your mapper step uh, step here i mean so whatever uh okay so in this case um so the mappers will be uh, I mean, so maybe we, we if we can store the words uh, and map them into, uh, 
I mean, into an object like you know, I mean, similar to hash map. So how we map them? So we can transform them into the uh, number of occurrences or number of uh, the frequency, and then uh, pass it to the user. Okay, and uh, I still don't uh, understand how. Let Let's suppose this is a Donald again using the same abusing the Donald uh, name. Uh, but let's suppose this is the term. Yeah. What would be the mapper step over here? <laughs> what operation am I doing here? Yeah, I mean, so I think here this is not possible. Why? Because uh, we'll have multiple objects. So, hmm. so the map uh, step is applied only. I mean, the transformation can only be applied on one particular object. Like you know, we cannot combine with other. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm assuming. So that's what I. Uh, yeah. No, I think uh, so, that's not a good uh, solution. I, I'll take uh, options that you know people are typing in the comments as well. Uh, so Jalkrit is saying, uh, Jackrit, sorry, uh, is saying that uh, we can use a no SQL DB as well. So uh, any time you appear for a system design interview, you should refrain from saying terms like uh, S no SQL. I'll use a uh, no SQL DB, and that will solve the problem for you. Why? Uh, see, uh, Google search type head problem can be solved using Rastic search, right? Uh, it gives everything that I want uh, out of the box. The aim for a system design interview is to judge whether you, if, if I give you a new problem, can you design it on your own? And then uh, if you answer uh, to, a, if your answer to a particular question is that I'll use a no SQL DB, my question would be which DB would you use? And then I'll dissect uh, whether you know the architecture, how that particular DB is designed or not. So unless you don't know how the architecture, uh, how the DB is architected, do not use these, uh, these terms in the interview. The, these are a red flag uh, when you, you know, use a random technology and, uh, don't know why, what is the uh, architectural decisions behind that particular technology. Try to stick to the basics. If you are using caching, don't say Redis. Uh, say I'll use a, uh, use a cache. Uh, in, uh, and when you're saying you use a cache, it should be clear in your mind that, hey, uh, this is going to be my key. This is going to be my value. And my this is uh, going to be my retrieval pattern. Right, uh, that is very much essential during an interview. So keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, um, sorry, over to you. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I cannot think of it. Uh, anyone who's done machine learning, uh, it, they would, uh, okay, I think, be able to. Uh, get a better hang of it it's a simple statistical tool typically used in uh, not just machine learning machine learning is one uh, area but it's a purely statistical uh, way of doing things <laughs> so someone so said pc and Bayesian, okay. Bayesian, uh, not really. Uh, but uh, what you can typically do is use sampling. Mm -hmm. Okay. The idea of sampling is that if it is popular, no, no, don't use average or anything like that. Just use sampling. If it is popular, uh, right, uh, there most of the time, if you just skip 99 requests and choose the uh, 100th request, it will be the uh, request of the most uh, popular one. For example, if it's a India versus New Zealand final that is going on right now, if I search for IND and missed out, you know, just randomly uh, choose the 100th uh, request, it will be uh, for India versus New Zealand. And because I have that kind of, uh, you know, scale, I can just remove uh, or let go of the 99% uh, of my request and just choose one uh, request that is coming to me. Of course, there will be some error threshold over here. It will not be accurate, but it will be a very much, uh, you know, uh, close to accurate guess, I would say. So sampling is one more uh, thing that you can typically do. Uh, I only consider the 99th 
uh, or maybe the hundredth request, ninety-nine request. I just uh, I, I won't just care about it. And in fact, uh, this sampling way is used in many uh, applications, right? Uh, wh what I was saying is, uh, so I'll just summarize what I uh, I just said, right? Uh, what I just said was that if something is very much very popular. Like, for example, if I type I and D, uh, I A will automatically be suggested because India has been searched by many people, right? Mm -hmm. If it is, uh, if, if there is something else that is coming out of uh, I and D uh, as a prefix, it will be searched by many other people as well. And by the law of averages or by the law of randomness, what I can surely say is that. Uh, even if I remove the 99 first 99 request, whatever is the hundredth request, that will the chance, the probability of getting that particular number, uh, which is popular, that is uh, you know really high for a uh, actually popular request. I'll give you a small example. I'll write as uh, let's suppose I have four spaces: one, two, three, and four. All right. What is the probability of picking one? It's one by four, 25. And so is yeah. the case with every other number uh, that is there in the array. Now let's make something some more interesting. Now what I've done is I've done, uh, I've added one more one. Now, if I ask you to pick a number randomly, there are 50% chances that I'll end up choosing one. Now let's do remove one uh, add one more one in the four numbers the percentage now shoots to 75 percent chances of getting one right and this is the uh, law of popularity out of the four numbers that i had one is really popular because it is occurring three times if I pick a choose a number randomly out of this particular batch, I have 75% chances that I will get one. For truly popular systems, the occurrence of this one is over 99%, right? And that is what I was hinting at. You just sample your request, take, create a sample of let's say a hundred batch. Out of that batch, pick one, uh, uh, pick one element randomly, and the chances are that you will be, you will end up picking up the uh, most uh, frequent or most frequently searched phrase. So this is a, a small uh, idea about sampling that you can uh, go back and apply in other systems as well. Yeah, I hope uh, this leaves you with a food for thought uh, and. Uh, yeah, uh, cool. Anything else uh, that you want to add, uh, Lokesh, on the uh, uh, on the problem that we have discussed? Um, so on backend, yeah, I think that's it. So, um, so I mean, just one thing is that you know, maybe on clients, uh, we need to add throttling. That you know, um, so like you know, as we are typing, um, so you know, like we said, debouncing. So this term called debouncing. Um, so, I mean, that means let's say if I type A uh, and there's an interval like, you know, like some uh, 600 milliseconds like that. So if I stop typing, then I should send a request. If I, I'm not stop typing, so, you know, I should not um, send the request. So that debouncing maybe will add on uh, my clients. So yeah. uh, to optimize. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah. it um, from my side. I think your voice is cracking. Uh, I don't know if it oh. is if that's just me uh, or oh, is so, it cracking. Uh, is it, so uh, is it fine now? now? Uh, is it fine? Yes. Uh, I mean, some yes, maybe. That's yes, that's better. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, cool. Mm -hmm. So we've discussed a problem, uh, a system design problem with everyone, uh, right? Uh, and I, uh, I think we uh, are 
quite done with a one hour mark that are typically uh, you know added uh, given for a system design interview as well uh, i'll give you uh, before leaving i'll uh, give you guys a thought about uh, what are the typical challenges that people uh, face during uh, system design interviews right uh, pacing yourself uh, is quite important uh, right i think the pace uh, that you showed lokesh uh, was uh spot on we were able to cover quite a lot of ground uh in 45 minutes uh we didn't touch upon uh, many factors as well i didn't go deep into uh understanding the uh, how would you implement a try and all that uh but i think that is not an objective of a uh objective as well uh right uh we didn't go into things like rate limiting and uh things like uh how would you actually uh, persist a try on db right uh, everything yeah. was there in memory so we didn't go into how would you persist a particular try so that yeah. in case a, in case the server restarts how how would you handle that uh, we've not discussed uh, so uh, we've not discussed the length of a particular prefix that you will add so would you add a also as a prefix into the consistent hashing ring or would you require a minimum length if you are having a yeah. minimum, like what are the pros and cons of all these uh, things that is something that we have not discussed uh, but uh, i think within a given the time frame uh, this is uh, this is a decent enough discussion uh, there are multiple other aspects as well that we can look at for example personalization uh, typically if you are uh, you know interviewing for a senior role you would be asked uh, to go uh, go into one peripheral area i didn't get a time to uh, you know dig deeper into the other peripheral features that we had missed out uh, the mm -hmm. other peripheral features are primarily there to test whether your uh, approach of the solution that you're giving is extensible or not right for example if on this particular system also you want to add personalization how would you change your change your tweak yeah. system do you require yeah. to change the entire logic if that is the case then your system is not extensible and extensibility is a major major component when it comes to testing uh, uh, testing out uh, things right so uh, i'll uh, probably jump to questions uh, that are there in the comments uh, right uh, if you have other prior engagements, I think uh, I, I had blocked only one hour uh, of your time, Lokesh. If you have any prior en uh, other engagements, uh, feel free to drop off. I'll take the questions and then I'll uh, 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 then I'll wind up. So do you want to stay or sure, do you so, want to um, stay? Um, so I want to drop off because my mom is waiting for uh, dinner. So yeah, sure, I'll sure. drop off, guys. All right. Uh, thank you okay, so much thanks. for your time, Lokesh. Uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks. All right, guys. Uh, so I'll take up all the questions that are that might be uh, there in this particular chat window. Uh, if you have, uh, if you've still not typed your question, please do so. If you want uh, me to interview you on, uh, do a mock interview for you as well. Uh, please mail us your uh, resume at youtube at scalar.com. I'll just type it down so that it's uh visible for everyone this is the id that you should be typically be looking at all right let's now go to the questions bhagya says fast response okay these are the answers where are they are there in question uh should we handle location current issues and frequency Eastern count. What's the profile of the interviewee? Uh, so the uh, I, I think uh, Jay Kirat, uh, we told uh, like in the beginning we started off with the uh, profile of the candidate. He was uh, having six years of experience in SD2 at uh, Akamai and uh, prior to this he was working with Book My Show. I hope this answers your question. Uh, So Jayvan has a question. Uh, in yesterday's short URL, uh, why we use user ID for the table? If you're searching for short code in the whole TV and providing the actual URL, won't be time using. How about using a key value pair? Uh, Jess, uh, one that was uh, so the schema that I wrote. 
uh, that is primarily for a system with a very very less uh, amount of uh, which is basically designed for very very less uh, users not for a massive scale a kv uh, a minimalistic kv is the one uh, that will work the best uh, for a url shortener kind of a uh, design so uh, try can be partitioned based on location uh, that is not a good approach i would say arpit uh, the reason we uh, because if we break it down break down the try uh, on a location basis that will be uh, adding personalization but what we were designing uh, today was basically a search type head that is globally uh, accessed and uh, the frequencies were also changing globally uh, the prefix approach that we uh, discussed in at the end uh, is basically the correct approach uh arpit says uh, you should not block reads how does it matter if the value goes a uh, little here and there exactly i think uh, what he is referring to is that when we are writing a particular system uh, that, that is when we should never uh, whenever uh, we update a particular frequency of a particular record uh, that is when we have to uh, basically block uh, all the reads because the write will take a lock on the particular record and hence uh, reads will not happen so we should avoid it at all cost uh, we have discussed two approaches to avoid that one is hashing and the other one is sampling so we can use either of the two approaches to uh, to basically block down the reads and write value uh so i see there are many people who have uh, told that caching is the best way to uh, do this particular thing however i would like to differ from uh, from them uh, caching for a search type ahead is not a very very good idea uh, right we are actually caching quite a lot of things in the node uh, where we just traverse to the node and we uh, we are finding the output we need to understand that caching by itself is not a solution to uh, reduce the latency for example if i maintain a hash map in memory that is much more faster as compared to storing the data in redis so whenever you are appearing for interviews and you know giving uh, your answers that i'll use caching have instead of using caching word or instead of using this uh, tell them where are you going to cache it are you going to have a distributed cache are you cache going to cache it uh, on the client side or are you going to use maybe a a, a distrib uh, or maybe at a load balancer or maybe at a global cache or a db cache specify what kind of caching you are going to do and what is the, going to be the key here in this case i am not sure what kind of what can be the typical key of uh, key for a particular cache how many prefixes can you typically cache also and the frequency also what if let's suppose i cache uh, i'm taking the same example donald if i cache don and save the top 5 words how would you update the top 5 frequency that will become a problem right uh, so i hope uh, everyone who is actually attending the session uh, understand that caching here is not the best way to go uh go ahead uh so vishnu says uh, no sql is a good option i think i have spent some time uh, describing that don't uh, directly jump to a no sql database identify what are the requirements that you would need to design such, such kind of a system and then uh, discuss the trade offs uh, directly jumping to a no sql uh, is a red flag especially if you are interviewing for a higher up profile for sd2 it will still be okay for but for sd3 it is a definite red flag is uh, it's memory already in memory what will you cache uh, what does it mean uh, exactly arpit that is what i was hinting at what would be the criteria for caching uh, i think uh, arpit i've answered that uh, we will shard based on the prefixes
Okay. Uh, so Vineet is asking what uh, what we need to be prepared before giving in uh, an interview with you. Uh, so uh, in this particular mock interview, I had uh, basically told uh, Lokesh that hey, I'll be asking uh, you to design a Google search type ad. So the question was given to him already before uh, he came for a uh, mock interview. Uh, so whenever I take an interview, mock interview with you, I'll probably give you a heads up that I'll be asking this question. The sole purpose of giving the topic beforehand is uh, we want to have a meaningful discussion while uh, uh, while on a mock session in an actual uh, interview of course you will not be knowing the topics so it's important to understand the system design concepts and prepare based on that so typically if you want to do a mock interview with me uh, i can give you a topic and we can have a mock interview on the, on that right any uh, such stream for low level design uh, so this system design interview is a super set of the low level design right it's based on two uh, important uh, parallels. One is the low level design. Uh, for a system design interview, you need to design the schema. Schema designing comes under a part of low level design. I, as an interviewer, might ask you to write some classes and code for that particular uh, you know, business logic that I'm asking you to implement. If you are a more experienced candidate, I might spend more time in discussing about the systems. Uh, right. Uh, if you have lesser experience, I might ask you to design the classes. For example, the same question: uh, How do you? How would you go about designing chess? Uh, I would ask this question differently to a person who has uh, maybe a college fresher or maybe have two years experience, and maybe uh, with a person of ten years experience. For a person with a ten uh, with ten years of experience, I will drill deep into how would you ensure uh, make this particular chess game into a multiplayer game, or uh, maybe not a multiplayer game, a basically a two player game, a uh, two player online game. How would he bake in artificial intelligence? How would he make sure that there is no plague? Uh, uh, there is no cheating component that is happening in the chess uh, tournament. So, uh, doing. Uh, focusing more on the system design aspects of it uh, for a 10 years experience for a lesser experience i'll probably spend time in how would you design the queen class how would you design the pawn class how would one extend to the other and uh, how would you abstract out the common functionalities that is what i'll test uh, probably for a with a two year experience candidate uh i've learned from uh, thank you so much uh, i hope uh, i take it as a compliment uh in memory hash map is not scale uh scalable can be used by a distributed server so you can have uh, a redis cache as well uh, in case you want to have uh, in case you are run limited by the number of uh, uh, or limited by the memory that your application servers are having, you can typically take this component out uh, in a different system itself, right? So uh, that would not be a problem. Uh, is it possible to explain try implementation at DB level in your upcoming YouTube masterclass? Uh, uh, unfortunately, YouTube masterclass will not use uh, any concept of try. Uh, what we can, however, do is uh, there are people uh, like we also take masterclasses on uh, data structures. We can pick this topic up uh, in one of the data structure masterclasses, uh, not at a um, um, at a system design masterclass, right? Uh, and uh, DBs, as far as I don't, I, I know there are no DBs which will allow you to persist or try. Uh, right? Uh, you have to store it as an object and retrieve it. Retrieve that as an object. For R, much much greater than W, keep uh, cache on servers and have some hybrid approach for write through and write back policies to update the data uh, back. Uh, yes. Uh, Pratik, we can do that, uh, but understand that tries are also stored in memory. So by storing, uh, by having a separate cache layer, you are not actually gaining anything out of it. The amount of time you will spend on reading from a try will be 
closely similar to what you will uh, to the performance that you'll get out of the cache as well because essentially both of the systems are reading uh, data from memory to find out the top k elements for a particular prefix the max you have to go for is maybe three or four characters or maybe five characters max and you'll get the complete string so you are actually not going uh, you know uh, traversing a lot of data when you when it comes to you know uh, having the uh, reading it from the drive redis is a event driven system and not necessarily uh, slow need uh, okay it's he's us answering this anand what is the question of anand okay redis is single threaded in nature it can slow down the entire system uh so redis even though it is uh, a single threaded it can serve uh, the kind of latencies that you can get out of uh, redis server is around 1 to 2 uh, or maybe sub 5 millisecond kind of latencies so in one second you can typically serve from a single uh, thread itself you can serve uh, around 500 200 200 uh, seconds and then there will be a thread uh, multiplexing can also happen so sorry uh, you can have a, a multi threaded application interacting with this particular uh, thread so that also will gain uh, give your system a huge bo uh, boost so uh, using context switching and all that uh, i have had uh, instances where i can with a single uh, redis server i can serve million uh, qps so redis is blazingly fast even though it is a single threaded application uh redis is a event driven system and non necessarily slow node js is about very fast uh, cpu intensive uh, so arpit says redis is a uh, event driven system and not necessarily slow uh, this drawing parallelism from a node js server cpu intensive application do require multiple uh, threaded system but uh, not with just a network i event intensive uh, agreed on this most of the time uh, is spent on io thread so uh, exactly so thread multi uh, thread content not thread contention i forgot the term for that uh yeah context switching so context switching will uh, there will be multiple threads which will be reading the data and using threads will uh, switch the context to give chances to other thread which is waiting for the uh, waiting to be get into running state uh sharding please i think uh, bhavan what you are asking is uh, are you asking me to explain what sharding means uh i'll be uploading one video on sharding on uh, under the system design series so uh, please stay tuned uh, right so uh if you are interested in knowing any other system design concept or topic uh, please feel free to comment on this video i'll uh, end this video now But tomorrow we uh, i'm going to tell you about how to uh, answer the uh, coding experiences uh, like how, how do i answer coding questions like dsa questions in an, uh, in an interview uh, i'll probably invite one more uh, speaker who will uh, tell so uh, I, i'll basically invite one more speaker who is uh, who is also done multiple uh, taken multiple coding interviews have himself cleared multiple uh, company coding interviews at multiple different different companies at farm companies as well so uh, tomorrow will primarily be focused upon how do you appear for and how do you think about a approach uh, when you are you know uh, going for these coding interviews and uh, day after tomorrow i'll take one uh mock coding interview uh similar to the, in a similar format that we have done uh today right so i'll see you guys tomorrow uh i'll leave uh the day, leave the class now uh hopefully that made sense uh, sense for you uh please subscribe uh, if you have not subscribed to our channel uh right uh, i'll see you guys tomorrow bye bye